Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, October 23rd, 2022. This is episode 1938. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. Visit collide.com slash twit to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by Mint Mobile. Get premium wireless service for just $15 a month with no unexpected plot twists. You'll make your wallet very happy by going to mintmobile.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, your personal tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know, all the gadgets and G Jaws and Jim Cracks. <laughs> now, after the uh, GIF GIF thing, I'm, I never know how to pronounce a hard G or a soft. Is it G Gaws or G Jaws? Or G Gauze or G Jaws. It could be anything above. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, we've got home theater coming up in just a bit with Scott Wilkinson. Nope, it's Sunday. It's Sunday. I missed yesterday. Thank you to uh, Micah Sargent. I hear a yelp of no from the other room. No! <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> It's Samable Samad coming up to talk cars in just a little bit. Of course, it is Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, and Rod Pyle, our space guy. That's uh, that's the Sunday lineup for the Tech Guy Show. But mostly, it's all about you and your questions and your calls. 8888-ASK-LEO is the uh, phone number. If you want to call in and ask a question or make a suggestion, uh, you know, try and understand what's going on in this wacky world of ours, 888 827 Five five three six. It's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you could still call, but you uh, need to use Skype out, something like that, some sort of voice over the internet doohickey. That I know how to pronounce. Doohickey. Eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. Website is techguylabs.com. Audio and video from the shows past uh, are there. There'll be links to the shows today. A transcript eventually. As to you know, the computer has to sit down. And, it's a big procrastinator, so we have to force it to sit down and, and do it, and then uh, and then we'll put that transcript up. Uh, also on Sundays, Professor Laura, our musical director's music log. So if you hear a song you like, you gonna play any Katy Perry for me today, Professor Laura? <laughs> I was in uh, Las Vegas uh, yesterday and the day before to see the final show of a, or a semi-final show of Katy Perry's. Uh, residency play it was quite a show quite a show um, looks like Elon Musk and Twitter are going to make a deal by the end of the month according to people familiar with the matter both sides bankers and lawyers are preparing paperwork for the buyout to be completed by October 28th that's the deadline the court has issued otherwise it's it's the courtroom for them Elon has said, you know, I'd hate to be working at Twitter. If you if you listen to the show and you're a Twitter employee, you have my deepest sympathies. I'd hate to be working there right now. The Twitter company, the current management says we're going to lay off 25% of the staff. Elon Musk says I'm going to lay off 75% of the staff. It's going to be pretty quiet <laughs> in the office as soon as this goes through. He also says no more you know, banning. We're going to bring back President Trump. Uh, I, you know, and we're not going to, and we're not going to enforce. You know, it's unclear what he's going to do. To be, to be honest with you, I've heard a variety of things out of his own, out of the horse's mouth, as it were. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'm waiting and seeing. I have a pretty good following on Twitter because I've been there forever. I joined Twitter when it first started in 2006. Quit it briefly. Uh, because I was concerned. My podcast network was called uh, Twit. And uh, I was a little uh, miffed 
annoyed and concerned. The people might confuse the two. They do. I often get asked, you mean Twitter? I said, no, no. Twit, Twit predates Twitter by years. In fact, I have the trademark to Twit. Uh, that didn't stop Twitter. Anyway, uh, so I've been a member and then I stopped for a few months. But, I, but I've been essentially using it since uh, the fall of 2006, you know, pretty consistently. Using it, mean, meaning what? Well, I read it all the time. Occasionally, I'll post to it. Not a whole lot. I used to post. I used to post all the time. You know, in the early days of social media, when you'd post your lunch menu, yeah. And as a result, you know, I have I think about five hundred thousand uh, followers on Twitter, which is a good late number. It's not you know the eighteen million President Obama has, but it's you know it'll do five for for little old me. I have to think though, you know, most of those people you know, no longer are on Twitter, probably. <laughs> I mean, they're there, but they don't use it. I would guess at least half. And then a half of the remaining uh, 125,000, those are probably bots and, you know, fake accounts. I would, I doubt very much there's more than 50,000 actual, one-tenth of the number actually uh, available, present, reading my tweets if I tweet something. I should try that. I should say, let's see a show of hands. How many of you read this? And then just count. It won't be that many. <laughs> but but the question is, do you stick around? Most people, I know most of you listening don't couldn't care less. No. Nope. Twitter, who cares? <laughs> nothing to me. It's nothing. And I guess it should be nothing, really. Right? It really, sh I mean, come on, let's face it. What What's the point of Twitter anyway? So we'll find out. You know what I'm not happy about? And maybe we can use this to re resurrect Twitter. <laughs> there are programs out there to resurrect your dead relatives. Uh, article in the MIT Technology Review by Charlotte G. She, her parents are still alive, but he, she had them uh, do the four-hour interview that this company, Hereafter AI, does they four hours of conversations with an interviewer about their lives and memories and then they recorded the voice and they make it sound like mom and dad she had conversations with them in the app in the app and she says it's it's weird <laughs> she says a a after a while well let me just read a little bit of this article my parents don't know i spoke to them last night they're still alive charlotte you really should be just calling your mom at first, they sounded distant and tinny, as if they were huddled around a phone in a prison cell. But as we chatted, they slowly started to sound more like themselves. They told me personal stories. Remember, this is not her parents. This is a machine that I'd never heard. Personal stories I'd never heard. I learned about the first and certainly not last time my dad got drunk. Mom talked about getting in trouble for staying out late. They gave me life advice and told me things about their childhoods as well as my own. It was mesmerizing. Uh, yeah. Look, I understand if you've lost a loved one, especially if it's unexpected and, you know, uh, sudden or whatever, that you really grieve them and you would love to say one last thing. So maybe this is healthy, but for it sounds a little creepy too, doesn't it? Um, from what I could glean, Charlotte writes, over a dozen conversations. Wow. That's a dozen times you didn't talk to your mom <laughs> over a dozen conversations that my virtually deceased parents uh, had. This will really make it easier to keep close to the people we love. Wow. Wow. Anyway, it exists. Is it a good idea? I, I don't know. I, I just I just don't I just don't know. Next week, ads come to the App Store. More ads on the uh, Apple iPhone. Just warning you ahead of time. Apple sent out a note to developers saying, you want to buy them? Huh? Huh? They're cheap. Huh? So uh, all this whole thing that Apple does about, oh, we don't, you know, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, we protect your privacy. We don't sell ads against your information. Well, that's not true. They do. Okay. <laughs> Just letting you know. Just letting you know. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh... We're going to take a little break, come back, take some calls. Sam Abul Samad is in the wings waiting with some sort of vehicle. 
talk about cars in about 15 minutes. This is the tech guy. Don't forget my number. 88, 88. Wait a minute. Who's answering the phone today? It's either Kim Schaff or, uh, or a little Lily. puppy dog named Lily. Lily's answering the calls. Lily's our today. house, our house uh, poodle. Toy yes, poodle. little chicken nugget. Burke's little baby. Little Burke did a thing, though, I'm not crazy about. <laughs> he gave her a mohawk. <laughs> did he do it intentionally? I think so. Oh, my friend has a poodle that has a major mohawk. This is an unshorn <laughs> poodle for the most part, except for the middle of the head. Very cute, She's Lily. so cute. She's very oh, sweet. So cute and so soft and so little. We, we love her. Yeah. <sighs> it's nice to have a moral support puppy at work. <laughs> I was, a, you know, so I flew to Vegas over the weekend and I saw a lot of, uh, fewer than before, it used to be a lot of support animals on oh. on board, but it's weird to see a dog walking through a Vegas casino. <laughs> I've gotten used to all the children walking through, but the dogs, that's weird. I Didn't, think they maybe have put the kibosh on some of that. <laughs> yeah. That's a, your, could be your companion, could be your support yeah. animal. Yeah. Who should I talk to uh, on this show today? Let's go to our friend in the chat room, Redacted. Um from Kent Island, Maryland. I don't think I've ever talked to Redacted. I don't know that you have. No, I but... don't know his real name or anything. <laughs> well, it's up there for you, but I didn't know if he wanted me to say it. Redacted, Leo <laughs> Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you, hey, kid. Leo. Hey, Redacted. First time, first time caller, long time listener. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, you've been in our chat. How long have you been uh, chatting with us? Oh, uh, five years or so. Yeah, I feel like you've been there a long time and you've never called in. No, I never had, but I never really had a question I wanted to... Uh, go on the air with, but I do now. Good. What can I do for you? Oh, so, so uh, about 15 years ago, there was a thing called Facebook that came out. And I joined it. <laughs> I've heard of them. And <laughs> yeah, so I joined them. And like most people, I went ahead and started looking up old high school friends. And that led to old high school girlfriends. Uh-huh. That's, that's really, that's I would say at least 50% of the people on Facebook. <laughs> that's what they do. Yeah, so that's what I did. Anyway, I was, uh, I was talking to friends and, you know, things were going kind of south and I figured out pretty quick that I was on a fast train to Divorceville. Oh, dear. And I wanted to get off. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Okay. There's the cautionary tale. Do not look up old girlfriends. Uh, yeah. Uh, word to the wise. Mm -hmm. So I, I got off uh, when I turned 50 and I never looked back and have not been on any social media for the last 10 years. Twitter. Uh, Instagram, anything like that. Isn't that a nice feeling? You yeah. know you know that there's something going on when people say, I'm going to do a detox and get off social media. Like, okay, that's a sign that it's toxic. Yeah, and it, and it was. But when my kids were going through college, they did their junior years overseas, and I'd have to shoulder that's, surf my wife on Instagram yeah, to yeah. see what they were doing and all that kind of stuff. So that, yeah. that kind of stunk. But fast forward, I turned 60 a few days ago. Happy birthday. And, uh, thank you. I had talked with Sam a while back. I had ordered a, uh, a lovely Ford Maverick from Hertrick Easton Ford over here in Maryland. Nice. And uh, long story short, over the course of the year, I got a lot of emails from, uh, from Ford saying, hey, sorry, it's delayed. Finally, come September, they said, oh, uh, your vehicle will be there in October. I said, great. So after that, uh, I got a phone call from the sales rep at the dealership saying, hey, we need to convert your order, even though I already knew that the vehicle was there. So I reached out to Sam. Sam helped me. They assured me that I would be getting my vehicle. Thank you, Sam. Sometimes a little uh, pressure in the right area can make a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah. He was a godsend. Good. So uh, Thursday, the dealership told me they got the vehicle. Uh huh. And Friday, I called them to pick it up, and they said, we've sold it. Oh, those sons of guns. After after 13 months. So I hate car dealers. I have to say, I've had nothing. And this is the one thing I think Tesla did right, is they just have their own network. In some states, they're not allowed to sell directly because the car dealerships have such clout with state assemblies and legislatures that in many states, it's illegal to sell a car directly from the manufacturer. Isn't that weird? Yeah, yeah. I it's bet Maryland's one of those states. I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, I wouldn't either, but... Uh, so that's already water into the bridge. I know there's nothing really I can do. It's about so it. frustrating. I, so frustrating. Make it painful for them. Did you have a deposit? Oh yeah. And they refunded it. Not yet. You better. Then you you might have them if if they don't. 
Yeah, so that's, like I said, I want to make it painful for him. So I go to the Better Business Bureau, file a complaint, go to Good. Yelp. Good. But I joined Twitter after never having been it on before. <laughs> the number one best use. reason to use Twitter. <laughs> I know. Talking to uh, Sam, uh, he mentioned it, Johnny Jet. Hey, if you have airline problems, get on Twitter. So I got on Twitter and I realized I have no idea how to use it. <laughs> how do I? How do I go... And stick it to the man over at this dealer. You're in you're in good hands, my friends, because <laughs> I am the Twitter whisperer. I taught Regis Philbin how to tweet on I, I live, live with Kelly and Regis at the time. Uh, he, the tweet he put out was, "I'm retiring. I'm getting out." <laughs> but and by the way, I should mention he got off Twitter about one week after I taught him how to use it. So you understand the basics of it. The, the, you know, it used to, uh, at the top of the page on when you go to Twitter.com and once you sign up for an account, it, would, it used to say, so what's happening? And you would type in something that's happening and that would be that. But there, it's important to understand that uh, times have changed a lot. If you don't have a lot of followers, just typing something in there is only visible to people who follow you. And if, you know, you're new to Twitter, you, that's probably about five people, including your wife, who probably knows better than Twitter. Yeah. So uh, the real useful thing for Twitter, especially for complaining about things, is the at reply. So the at, you know, you do the at sign and then you need to know the account name. So at Ford, for instance, um, yeah. the best way to do that is to use the Twitter search. Go into your Twitter account, use the Twitter search and type in uh, the name of the dealership. What's the name of the dealership again? Hertrick Ford in Eastern Maryland. Hertrick Ford. And so you search for her trick Ford. Let me just see if they're on Twitter. <laughs> they're probably not, right? Because they're they're stupid faces. <laughs> uh, so and then when you hit return, you'll get you can search for top latest people photos and videos. You want people with that, and yeah, they have an account, but there's no there's nobody. They're not. They st oh, here's what they did. They created an account. Oh, no, that's Herrick Ford. That's a different Ford. Her trick. Yeah, it's, they don't it's, seem to have a Twitter account, so you're not going to be able to tweet them. But oh, you can tweet at the big Ford company. In fact, that's probably the best thing to do, right? Get them in trouble with the uh, boss. So that's at Ford. That's at Ford. So you just type at Ford, and then whatever you want to say. These people at Her Trick uh, Ford in Maryland are terrible, and uh, you see what they did, and... You know, can I tell you the truth of this? This is this is <laughs> useless. Nobody's going to see this or care about this. However, <laughs> the, for some reason, big companies think that their reputation is, you know, being damaged. So you may well get a response from at Ford. Yeah. Uh, whether you'll yeah. get satisfaction is another matter entirely. But, you know, it's good I, to do I, this. I just I, venting publicly is satisfying. Yeah, it makes you feel better. Um yeah. It's weird I, uh, that a dealership doesn't have a Twitter account, but you know, maybe that I would keep looking. Maybe I just did a cursory search, but at no at them at Ford. Now, here's another little trick: uh, when you at type when you begin your message with at Ford, the only people who see it are at Ford or people who are searching for them. You know, it's not it's not doesn't become part of your you know regular routine so start it with a period you'll see this from time to time that means this goes public as well as to ford so you start it, if you type text that's not the at part beforehand it'll go to everybody i'll give you some more tips off air leo laporte the Thanks, tech leo. guy i also found the official lita ford twitter I found Doug Ford, the premier of Ontario, <laughs> Tom Ford, I guess the designer. So, yeah, you find a lot of Fords here. Ford Performance, Ford yeah, I UK. I probably needed to expand on the Ford part a little bit. Yeah, just keep looking. And then, um, you know, I wouldn't harass them. You certainly could. You could tweet every day. No, if it no, makes no. You yeah. Feel better. No, I'm not a harasser. I'm too old for that. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think if Elon goes through with his plans, this will be even less useful than I believe it already <laughs> is. But it's worth doing it now while you can. And then you're right. It gives you some satisfaction. You already went to the Better Business Bureau. That's good. Do it on their Facebook yeah, account as well. But Twitter, something about complaining on Twitter. The companies are very sensitive to that. Yeah, and having watched your show for a number of years, I hear a lot of people mention that. And you've mentioned it several times. So I thought, what the ah. heck? 
Ah, here we go, Redacted. Hertrick family. Oh, you can really go where it... I, it's spelled with an H. I did not spell it with an H. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So that's why I didn't find it. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Scooter X is the master of something. I don't know what it is, but he, Thank you, Scooter. he's very good at finding stuff. Uh, oh, yeah, so, his Google Foo is awesome. His Google Foo. That's what it is. Hey, it's really great to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Leo. Thanks you, so you've much. You've been lurking for, for so long. Oh, yeah, here it is. Hertrick Ford, Lincoln and Milford, Delaware. Hertrick Ford in Eastern Maryland and Hertrick Ford Easton. Eastern Maryland. So they have three Twitter accounts. Yeah. Like a lot of places over here and probably in California elsewhere, you know, one family owns. Yeah. You know, one. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Hansel family owns all our dealerships. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't get mad. at You can't say, well, I'm going across the street because it doesn't do any good. <laughs> I'm going to Santa Rosa. It doesn't do any good. They own it all. Yeah, it oh, they're terrible. I mean, dealerships are terrible. Get a, Wait till you get an electric vehicle from Ford. So I was thinking about getting, and I talked to Sam about this, the uh, the Lightning. Yeah. The Lightning. Yeah. But what I use it for, it's twice, even with the tax rebate, it's twice the cost of yeah. that. Yeah, the batteries are expensive. Yeah. It saves you money in the long run, I think, but the batteries are expensive. Depends on your electric rates. Jerry, our, uh, our chief operating officer here, has a, a Lightning. I took a ride in it on Thursday and or Wednesday, and it really is beautiful. They really did a nice job, but and he loves yeah, it. But you're right, they're pricey. Yeah, and I saw the review that Sam did, uh, the Rivian versus oh, the good. Lightning. I think it was on your network yes. as, a, as a Twit special. It was really interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's so great to talk to you. Can I call you Ray? You certainly can. <laughs> you could call me Ray. <laughs> it doesn't have to call me Ray. Yeah. You, you just don't call me and tell me you sold my Maverick out from under me. <laughs> oh, my God. I'd be so... You sound so nice about it. I'd be so angry. Oh, I, I vented for uh, two days, but it's one of those things that's just going to eat at you. And yeah, well, yeah, you're right. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, But how frustrating is that? You've wanted that car for a year. Yeah, 13 Th months. Just terrible. Yeah. Just terrible. Um, so disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, you know, there are people like that around everywhere, so you just don't do business with them. Yeah. Yeah, that's just that's just greedy, and you know it's a mistake because how much more do they make? Maybe ten thousand dollars more or something. Yeah. Uh, Sam and, and a friend of his at Corporate Ford, uh, they said, yeah, it sounds like they're trying to sell it out from under you. Yeah, because they got somebody to pay more. They already told me it was you know hey it's on it's it's on the car carrier and it's heading to Maryland. Jerks. And then two days later they call up and say hey we need to convert your twenty two to twenty three. You're not going to get the first edition. You have to pick a different color. Ugh. And then I just. This is why we really have to stop car dealerships. And they, it, it, it's just horrendous. They're all horrendous. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Jerry's uh, Ford F-150 Lightning, they bumped up 10 grand over MSRP. He paid yeah, it. That's why I didn't want to. That's yeah. why I didn't want to buy something off a dealership lot because of the markup. Yeah. Terrible. I'm sorry, Ray. Or is it. Should I call you Ray Dacted now? You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Have a good one. Ah, uh, yes, it's time, as Mike B. reminds me, to talk about our fine sponsor, Collide. Collide. You've heard, I think you've heard me talk about Collide. It, uh, in a nutshell, is user-centered, cross-platform, endpoint security for teams that slack. But let me unwrap that a little bit. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. So often in IT, we treat the end users as the enemy, or at the, at the very least as unwitting <laughs> tools of the enemy, right? So old school device management solutions like MDM put, you know, you're putting a set, what is essentially what the employees see as a disruptive agent onto their system that will slow their performance down, that maybe isn't as private as they would like, causes problems, and 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 limits them from doing things they want to do, you know? Well, let's face it, right? If you're, if you're the kind of IT professional who puts crazy glue in the USB ports, hey, I, f I understand. <laughs> I do. I understand. But Collide has a kind of a different attitude toward this. Instead of turning your end users into enemies... And, and by the way, the end result of that is they end up using their, now that they're working from home a lot, they're using their own computers and their own devices. They're, it's all B, BYOD all the way down. And you don't want that, right? That's even worse. 
What Collide does is it sends users security recommendations via Slack. So obviously you have to be a Slack house. In fact, this is this is so good, I would become a Slack house if you're not using Slack. Collide automatically notifies your team, your team, when devices are insecure, tells the end user how to fix it, why there's a problem. By the way, it really focuses on here's why this is a problem. Here's why it's a problem that your computer uh, goes to sleep without locking, you know, or that you're storing your uh, restore codes in your downloads folder unencrypted, things like that, right? And it will find them, it sees them, and then it gets it gets your employees to fix it and understand why it's a problem. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help you build a culture, this is really important, where everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. Keeping your users in the dark is not a good solution in the long run. You know what? You could still use all your perimeter defenses. You could still do a lot of the things you would, almost all the things you would do. I just think Collide is a great way to get users involved. For IT admins, you'll love Collide's single dashboard. lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet. And by the way, truly cross-platform, Mac, Windows, even Linux. So you can see at a glance, for instance, which employees have their disks encrypted. Uh, who hasn't applied the OS updates? Who's using a password manager and who isn't? Who's writing it on Post-it notes? <laughs> no, it doesn't know that, but it knows they're not using a password manager, right? So it makes it easy for you to get things fixed, to prove compliance to your auditors and your customers and your leadership. That's increasingly important, right? Collide, user-centered, cross-platform, endpoint security for teams that Slack. Now, does that make sense? You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. You really can. That's the hardest barrier here is to convince people, no, no, your users are not the enemy. They can be your army. Visit K-O-L-I-D-E, collide.com slash twit to find out how. And by the way, some great goodies for you. They've got Collide stickers and coasters and very nice. These are, these are really nice, soft Collide t-shirts. There's a couple of these couple of different designs just for activating a free trial i think i brought did i bring the other t-shirt home i have one here oh this is a nice navy one k-o-l-i-d-e dot com slash twit <laughs> i love that one with pinocchios k-o-l-i-d-e dot com slash twit we thank collide for supporting the tech guy you know they believe that they're reaching out to some it professionals out there Show them they're right. Use that address, collide.com slash twit. No credit card required. Thank you, Collide. He's a low-riding fella, Mr. And he does ride low because he drives a Miata, which is as low as you can go. Sam Abu Samad, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights, wheelbearings.media. Hi, Sam. Hello, Leo. How are you today? Ah, uh, you heard Ray's tale of woe. I did. And, you know, I, I tried to help him out uh, with that. Uh, you know, he reached out to me in the chat uh, about three weeks ago when he got the notification from Ford that his truck had been built. He had a VIN number. It was shipped. It was on its way to the dealer. It was supposed to be delivered this past week. And then the next day he was called. He got a voicemail from somebody at the dealership saying, yeah, you know, we're not going to be able to get your 22, even though he already knew, you know, from Ford that the, it, the truck had been built. And as soon as he told me the story, I knew right away what they were, what was going on. You know, if, if Ford doesn't send out that notification until the truck is at, until the vehicle is built and it's on its way to the dealership for delivery, which means that the dealer would, you know, had probably already arranged to sell that vehicle for that a truck higher to price, somebody else, no doubt, for yeah. ten, fifteen, twenty thousand yeah. dollars over sticker, right. And, you know, they were just waiting for the notification that it was on its way before they tried to cancel and, and redo his order. Is that illegal? Order. Is there anything you could... Uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, unless you have, you know, unless you have a, a firm purchase contract for with the dealer for that specific vehicle, there isn't much you can do because the, the, prob the problem is the dealers are independently owned businesses. And the way it works is, you know, the manufacturer builds the vehicle, they ship it to the dealer that, that places the order. And once it rolls off the truck, off the delivery truck, the dealer owns that vehicle. Ford or GM or Honda or Nissan, whoever it might be, they no longer own that vehicle at that point. 
So that dealer can do whatever they want with it. Hmm. And unless you have an, a, a purchase contract with that dealer that says, I'm going to buy this vehicle with this VIN number for this price, they can do whatever they want, basically. Um, and you know, how, they come, how come it's illegal to sell directly to customers? So, you know, the the pro the reason why the, the franchise dealer network grew up the way it did in the first place is, you know, early on in the industry, you know, a lot of manufacturers, you know, they would build vehicles and then they had the problem they had to actually sell them. You know, which is a problem that Tesla had for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, it you know, with with trying to sell direct, you know, but you know, back in the early 20th century, you know, they didn't have the internet to do this. You know, it was a lot harder. And so the the manufacturers, you know, would have all this inventory of vehicles that were unsold, and it cost a lot of money to to maintain that inventory. And so, you know, they came up with this franchise model where um dealers, you know, would buy a franchise from the manufacturer giving them the right to sell that, that company's products. And, you know, over time dealers, dealers make a substantial investment in real estate and equipment and training and staff. You know, it's not a trivial thing and it, it's not a trivial thing for a manufacturer to sell direct, you know, as, as much as people like the direct sales model from companies like Tesla and Rivian, it's really expensive for those companies to do that. Um, you know, because they have to have, service infrastructure uh you know they have to have the the showrooms they have to have the delivery infrastructure and uh you know so over time as you know as dealers you know made you know viable businesses they of course as most businesses do they contributed money to their local politicians to you know try try to lock in that business and one of the things that happened was laws across many many states that say okay these dealers have made a big investment in their in their equipment and their in their real estate and their buildings and their staff. And we don't want the manufacturers to come in and try to undercut them and compete directly with them. You know, which is it's not a totally unreasonable thing. But the problem then comes, you know, once you've locked in that kind of somewhat monopoly, a lot of businesses tend to abuse that monopoly, which is exactly what Hertrick Ford did here. Mm. Um, most dealers don't do this sort of thing. You know, well, you know, the problem is we we hear about, you know, the, these these bad dealers that do this sort of thing. But the reality is most dealers don't engage in these sorts of practices. They don't put, you know, unreasonable markups on vehicles. Um, you know, and, you know, we really need to call out businesses like Hertrick Ford when they do this stuff, I we need saying the name we, a lot. <laughs> we need to we need to make sure that people know that they should never ever go to a Hertrick family dealership in Maryland yeah. and never buy a vehicle yeah. from these Punish guys them. because yeah. there's a chance that that you won't get what you what you paid for. This seems to be and, a big problem uh, with electric vehicles that are in very high demand. I was mentioning one of our employees yeah. bought a F one fifty Lightning from a Ford dealer. They marked it up uh, ten thousand um, dollars. That's pretty typical and, these days. I was lucky. I got my Mach-E at MSRP, which is still a markup, right? The dealer still makes money on that, right? They don't. They, pay they, they do. They do make some money on that, you know, because they pay a wholesale price, an invoice price to the manufacturer, and then they sell it at a markup. But of course, as I said, you know, these dealers also have a substantial amount of overhead that they yeah. have to pay for. So, yeah. you know, the margins that dealers actually make on new vehicle sales are actually fairly slim. They make most of their most of their profit. You know, on you know, selling accessories, on service and maintenance, um, you know, so it's it's a t it's actually a really tough business. It's it's not. I understand that, yeah, but maybe it's yeah. time now it to abandon that model. Tesla does okay. In fact, Tesla's had to go into states and say, "Can we please sell direct in this state?" We do. I think Texas well, is one te of those, right? You know, te Tesla has had their challenges too. Yeah. You know, there have been times, you know, when Tesla makes their end of month pushes, you know, to deliver as many cars by the end of the quarter or end of quarter pushes. And, you know, there have been, you know, lots of reported cases over the years of customers that because the way Tesla does it, you have to um, pay, you know, up front before the car is delivered in full, uh, you know, online. You do a wire transfer or, you know, pay it on a credit card, however you're going to do it. And then, you know, there have been reports of people that paid in full for their cars. They had a VIN number assigned to them. And then 
you know, the next day they get a message from, from Tesla saying, Oh, we're sorry. We're not going to be able to get you that car, you know, and you know, we'll, we'll get you another one in about three weeks time or four weeks time. Um, you know, we'll find another one for you. And, you know, while it hasn't been proven, it's, it's generally believed that what has happened is that Tesla, once Tesla has gotten that payment from one customer, then sometimes they've taken that car, reassigned it to another customer and gotten payment from that customer. So they get paid twice, um, you know, so that they, it bumps up their, their end of quarter revenue numbers, you know, and then they deliver the car to that first customer several weeks later. And, you know, they've all, there's, they also have a lot of challenges with service and, you know, providing service to their customers because they have limited locations for service. So it's, you know, yeah, I, that makes I, sense. I, I if think, you don't have a dealership think, I, in the state, yeah. where are you going to go uh, for service? Yeah. yeah that's and, an and interesting I think, problem. You know, manufacturers are working to try and change the, the dealer agreements that they have with their dealers to, uh, you know, to try to, um, and then they're doing things like, you know, what Ford has said, you know, that they're doing when they find dealers that are doing these egregious markups, um, they'll actually, you know, on popular vehicles, they'll actually cut their, that, that dealer's allocations in the future for those popular vehicles. Oh, they can vehicles. punish them. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they can yeah. punish them. You know, and, it's not the, the only business mind where this about happens. Dealers. Don't ever try to buy a concert ticket yeah. in the United States from Ticketmaster yeah. oh, yeah. because their monopoly means they get to really uh, upsell uh, your ticket and just look at those service charges. So this right. is this is not unusual. And, it's whenever monopolies happen, this is what happens. Yeah, and and the other thing to keep in mind, you know, I mean, this is a phenomenon. You know, we've seen this phenomenon of dealers, you know, selling vehicles to other customers or putting big markups over the last year and a half because of the supply chain shortages and the shortage of new vehicle inventory, but. Most of the time, what happens is dealers have too much inventory, and they have to they have to cut the prices. So it's a it's a it's a supply and demand model. Yeah. And when supply is tight, and demand is high. You know, the the prices change. And I'm sure in the dealers' minds, they're saying, "Look, we're just trying to stay in business, and sometimes yeah, we no, have absolutely. to do this." Sam yeah. Abul Samad, uh, principal researcher at Guidehouse, listen to his Wheel Bearings podcast, and he joins us every week. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Leo. I imagine uh, that uh, Hertford uh, is getting uh, <laughs> or hurt trick. Well, I, I tweet I tweeted about it. You know, they're getting a few that calls today, a or you know, yeah, or tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it it's it's a it's a challenging business to be in. Yeah, I know? think that and that's good. It's it's appropriate to mention that as well. That, that you know, yeah, I mean, it, it goes it goes both ways. You know, you, yeah. we have markups right now, but a lot of the time, you know, in in other time periods. You know, you go in and you negotiate with the dealer and you can often get the, the vehicle for under sticker price. Right. Um, right. So it, it all depends on on how much how much availability there is. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, don't go to hurt. You know, any dealer like Hertrick Ford that, you know, you've got a contract with them, you know, you've specifically you've ordered a specific vehicle and it arrives and they go and sell it to somebody else. You know, just don't even bother. Just go. There's 3,000 Ford dealers in the United States. So right. 3,000 Chevrolet dealers. Just find another dealer. There's you, know, a, you'll, you can find one that will treat you better. There's a brisk uh, business on Reddit uh, from people saying, hey, don't go mm -hmm. to this guy. Go to this guy. He overcharged me here. You can find somebody uh, just going. Yeah. And there's there, there's actually a website um, that I think I mentioned a, a month or two ago. Ah. Called, I think it's markups.org. Ah. Um, that's crowdsourced. Um I'll have to find it again. Um, yeah, markups.org, uh, where people are putting in information when, when about dealers that are putting in, you know, putting big markups on vehicles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so like, yeah, I just pulled it up. Um, dealer name, Sansone Junior 66 Kia, uh, markup $9,000 on a Kia Telluride. Um, you know, Toyota of Lancaster, markup $6,400 on a Toyota Sienna. Yeah, you know, and and it goes on and on. You know, it's it it's yeah. You know, oh, here we go. Hertrick Ford of Milford markup forty thousand dollars on a Bronco oh, Raptor. Oh my God! Oh. They're they're like number five on the list here. Oh. So yeah, it uh, it's pretty. You know, it's it's a tough time to be trying to be buying a vehicle. So, um. Oh, next Sunday I won't be here. Oh, good. Um, okay. I will be I will be on a plane to uh, Palm Springs. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
So going make a note of that, BMWs. Professor Laura. No Sam on Sunday. All right. Um, uh, do you want right. to stick around for the top of the hour or no? Sure. Yeah, I can do okay. that. I'll let you have this um, and minute and a half. I can I can talk a little bit more about the the cars I was going to talk about today, which are the. Uh, uh, the the Foxconn EVs um, that uh, they showed off a couple of new EV concepts this week. Foxconn wants to get into the contract vehicle contract manufacturing business. They they don't necessarily want to be selling Foxconn branded vehicles, um, but they want to build vehicles for other companies that need some manufacturing expertise. Not that Foxconn actually has a whole lot of expertise manufacturing vehicles, but they they build a lot of other stuff. They build iPhones and iPads and 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 a lot of uh, a lot of consumer electronics devices for a lot of different brands. Um, and uh, they uh, uh, they've developed uh, their own EV platform, an open source EV platform that they call they refer to as the the Android for EVs. Uh, they call it MIH Mobility in Harmony. And uh, we will probably be seeing the first of these vehicles built on this platform here in the U.S. Uh, probably early 2024, first half of 2024, most likely, uh, from a company called Fisker. Uh, and I will talk some more about that in the next segment. There's a German company that does the white label manufacturing. Uh, well, it's, it's Magna Stier. Magna Stier, that's it, yeah. Yeah, it's a, Can it's a Canadian-owned company, oh, Canadian. but they, they have oh, okay. a factory in Austria. Thank you, sir. All right. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. D's on the line from Charleston, Rhode Island. Hello, D. Hi, Leo. Can you hear me? I hear you great. Thank you for calling. Oh, good. I don't have to stand outside. <laughs> <laughs> no. Where are you? I'm in Charlestown, Rhode Island. Yeah. Charlestown. I said yeah. tun. Charlestown. Okay. Yep. You'd think I'd know that growing up in Providence, but I... I just... Yeah. I know it. Yeah. Foolish me. 45-minute ride. Nice. Yeah, all the way across the state. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm surprised it's that long, to be honest. <laughs> what it can I... It's a small state. It's, it's the smallest. What can I do for you, Dee? Leo, I'm just so grateful that get through. Thank oh, yay. I'm call. glad you did. Uh, you know, I... Long-time listener uh, since... 2012 maybe nice um and anyway you uh you sold me on buying a chromebook instead of doing windows anymore great and so i in march of 016 i bought an hp chromebook okay for 225 dollars. nice deal and you've got six years yeah, out of that that comes down to pennies yeah. a day <laughs> i know right yeah and i i love it i actually was able to talk my husband into getting one. It's nice. convincing because he was hooked on Windows. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, Windows, some people need Windows, but if everything that you do it lives in the browser, then a Chromebook is definitely a more secure and simpler environment that does the job. Exactly. Yeah. That's what was so convincing. You yeah. convinced me, and I said, you know what? All I do is pay my bills online, shop online. Perfect. And I do use documents, you know, because yeah. I'm self-employed. Good. But uh, I have an issue um, and it's ironic because I can get on these websites on my husband's Chromebook, but not mine anymore. And one of them is, um, my track phone account. I cannot get on for, it's been almost a year. I, I can't log on. So what on. happens when you try to log on? Well, it tells me to put in my SIM number or my phone number or my email and click, I'm not a robot, but the shade the the tab that says to continue won't light up so I can click on it. And I finally got some tech support from track phone today. Um, spent some time on the phone with them and the technician told me that she could get on it on her computer. Oh, interesting. So the first thing to do, uh, this is a useful tool. There's a couple of possibilities. Six year old Chromebook may be out of support. Your husband's is more recent. Uh, and some Chromebook, and this is the sad thing about Chromebook, Google decides not to support them after a period of time, and so you don't get updates. So maybe your browser is out of date. But bef So one thing to do is to check the version of Chrome you have on there. And if it's pre-100, let's say, 
and it's not updating, then that's probably the case that your your Chromebook is out of date. But the easiest thing to do right now, have you ever power washed your Chromebook? No, I, I, I wanted to ask about that. Yeah. I did go on my settings, and my settings said that my updates, I'm up to date, but every oh, time good. I go on my documents, it's, when I go into my documents, though, it tells me that Chromebook no longer supports yeah. this browser so you're at, so you are not up to date yeah you're up to date as far as you can get but you're out of support now and this does happen uh yeah six years is probably is out of support yeah in fact your husband's how old is your husband's um 18 yeah so he's got another year but then chrome os stops getting updated and what happens sometimes with some uh sites banking and finance particularly is they'll say well you don't have the latest version of chrome so you cannot uh use our service i don't know why track phone would do that but maybe they have so um well, the thing is i i read today and yesterday i've been trying to get on my chase credit card account and i can't same thing yeah wheel Yes. And I got on it, no problem, on my husband's laptop. Yeah, because his is a little less old, but he's going to have that same problem in a year. Uh, this is a real annoying uh, This is a real annoying thing, but it's you know it happens with all operating systems. After a period of time, they don't want to keep um, updating it. So uh, there is a website that you can go to. Typically, it's about six and a half years. I think that's probably what what's <laughs> what's happened is your Chromebook has hit its a sell by date. Um, there, okay. there is a, if you go to about Chrome OS, uh, and then additional details, the, you'll see it, uh, under update schedule, a list of when you go out of, uh, update and, and I suspect that's what's gone on. So the, uh, the solution to that is buying a new Chromebook. I hate to say it. Well, I, I'm fine with that. I just didn't want to go Wait, and do it if it wasn't yeah. necessary. So go. I, so again, go to, to a. To get through. So you know, under in in your Chrome, you'll see about Chrome OS, or maybe it's in the menu. I've forgotten. Uh, and then under in about Chrome OS, there's an additional details area. They kind of hide some of those details, including the update schedule and it'll tell you if you've hit your end of support date it'll say when the end of support date is your husband you should do it too because he's going to hit that date as well it's around six years it really depends on the on the device but i think that's exactly what's happened is your your chrome os is out of date which at some point uh and by the way that that number changes i think uh, google's actually ex uh, extended that a little bit um that was that was, uh, but that's from your era, the 2018 Chromebook. So, yeah. um, I can so when I can I get the new one when yeah. I get the new one. Yeah, you'll have the same. <laughs> Everything will work fine because you'll be using a current version of uh, Chrome. And uh, I let me see. Let me just look. I can look it up on the uh, Google site. Your HP. What model is it? Do you know? Um. Chromebook 14, Intel, Celeron. Celeron, 14. okay, 14. So it just depends. They make a lot of Chromebook 14s. I think the easiest thing to do is, I will put a link in the show notes to the Google page where they say all of the different models and when they expire, but I think you can just see that on your Chromebook. If it has expired, time to get a new Chromebook. Otherwise, what you could try is a power wash, uh, Power washing brings the Chromebook back to the day it came. So if there's some other issue, an extension installed on there that's blocking it or some other things that are going on, power washing is really one of the main features of the Chromebook because you can then get it back to the factory state. And because you use Google Docs and all that stuff, you won't have lost anything. All the settings will be that's there as soon as you log into your Google I'm account. Curious about. Yeah. As okay. long as you log into your Google account, everything comes back, right? The only everything thing a power wash will wipe out that you can't get back is anything you stored locally. That's why you don't, that's why it has such a small internal drive and you're really discouraged from storing anything there. Okay. So if you do have anything there, copy it off onto a USB key or something and then do a power wash. But I suspect much more likely you're right at the edge. Uh, I think it's probably expired. So again, look, right, look, fine. yeah, look in the about this Chromebook uh, section of your settings and you can, 
and you can see this. Did, did you follow that? I'll put a link if you want more. It says, I, I was Googling it, so no, now I'm in settings. About Chrome OS, about Chrome OS, and then additional details. So I'm just going to type in Chrome OS? No, 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 no. It's, uh, it's actually in the menu. So go down the menu and look for about. And then you should be able to, once you get there, you should then say additional, to be able to see additional details. And once you see additional details, it should send, send you to another area where you'll get uh, your end of life. And I, I think it's almost certain that that's what's going on, the end of life date. Again, I'll put uh, links to uh, two pages, one that tells you how to find out what your end of life date is, and then the other that tells you that Google's own pages saying for every Chromebook when that end of life is. And your husband should look up his there as well. Uh, because I think his is probably close. They are getting longer. So when you buy a Chromebook now, find out before you buy when its end of life is. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So I had to take a break there, but you still there, right? I am. So Good. I'm on that spot where I clicked on about Chrome OS. Okay. So now, And then do you see an additional details menu entry there? Detailed build information. This is an old article, so it may have changed. About Chrome OS, More. additional details. There should be a, a menu in there or a button in there. I don't have a Chromebook in front of me or I would be following along. Check for updates tab. Under or About Chrome OS. It says get help with Chrome OS. Report an issue or detailed build information or all of my options. Try the detailed build information. See if it's there. Okay, so now it says platform, firmware, channel. Does it show you? V8, user agent, command line. Is there an update schedule there somewhere? Okay, we're going to try it. It was on, on the previous. I did that already. Update schedule. Well, no, not do an update. What you're trying to find is a, is a information about your update schedule, in particular, when its end of life or end of support date happens. Almost certainly with a six-year-old Chromebook, you've hit that. That sounds like exactly I'm, the symptoms. I think so, because like I said, when I went on my documents, it yeah, said no, Google's saying the no same thing. Support. Yeah, and you've updated to as far as you can go. So, yeah, I think it's time yep. for a new one. The good news is 225 well, bucks. Anything. You will only lose stuff you've saved locally. But I don't even understand what that means. So good. Probably That's probably okay then. Sometimes when you're on a website and it says download this, you can download it to the internal storage of the Chromebook. You're really not, the whole idea of a Chromebook is you don't need to do that. We'll take care of everything, we'll put it on your Google Drive. You know, your docs are stored on Google Drive. So almost certainly everything you've done is stored on your Google Drive. All right. So I shouldn't bother doing the power wash thing. I wouldn't. Right? I think you need a new Chromebook. And you deserve one. I got it on Amazon. I'll just get another one on Amazon. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And get one. Uh, check the end of life. You don't want to get one that's, that's uh, 2022. That way, you know, you'll get the maximum end of life. All right. So... Me, I can Google that. Um, if I pick one out, I can just Google that. It should say. It should say when you buy it. It should say. Oh, it should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It should be Thank in the so in the specs. Yeah. I'm sorry this has happened to you, but you know, you got six years for 225 bucks. That's a pretty good yeah. deal. That's two bucks a month, three bucks a month. I, I can't complain. I think you're I, all right. You know, <laughs> I'm so glad I called. I'm so glad you took my call. Oh, it's great to talk to you, D. How are things in Charlestown? Is it beautiful? Are you by the sea? No, I'm seven miles from the coast, and it's raining today. Oh, I always check in with my mom to see what the weather's like. Yeah, I know. I, I just love it that I found out you came from Rhode Island. I'm and a I local, was local kid. All the time. <laughs> Thanks, you Dee. Know? Have a great so day. Cool. Stay dry. Thank you. You too. All righty. Okay, bye-bye. Bye -bye. Sorry, Sam, all yours. No problem. Um, speaking of Chromebooks, I highly recommend the uh, Lenovo Flex 5 Chromebook. Uh, my wife's been using one for a couple of years now. It's excellent. Uh, really 
well built, uh, nice keyboard, backlit keyboard, really nice display. It's a touch screen. Uh, it's a two in one, so it folds around, uh, and you can get them uh, often See, on sale. Three fifty six on Amazon. on Amazon. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, for the sixty four yeah, gig it, version. It's it's yeah. a, it's an excellent machine. Good, and that's with eight gig of RAM. So. Yeah, that's one of the, the problems that a lot of Chromebooks have is they don't have enough RAM. Right. And you know, for for three hundred and fifty bucks with eight gig of RAM, you you you're in pretty good shape with a Chromebook. Boy, I wish they would say, and I don't see this on the listing, when the end of life is on this and the support. Um, that one, I think the the five I came out last year, so I think it's twenty twenty eight or twenty twenty nine because yeah. it's typically eight years Google from the time be, it's released. It is now. Yeah, they've extended yeah. that. Yeah. Ooh, we should really be clearer about that. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give it to you for a few minutes while I get a cup of coffee. All right. All right. Sounds good. Um, so um, to finish off what I was uh, mentioning here earlier about Foxconn, um, Foxconn a couple of years ago uh, decided they wanted to get into, they wanted to expand their business. They do contract manufacturing uh, for a lot of consumer electronics. They decided they wanted to get into automotive business and, so they uh, uh, they designed uh, a new EV platform that they call MIH Mobility and Harmony, and you know basically they put it out there. You know anybody that wants to get into the EV business, you can use this platform. We'll build it for you. Uh, you can you know have whatever design you want put on it. And they've shown a few different examples this this past week at an event in in Taiwan. Uh, they showed off the uh, the Model V pickup truck and the Model B. Uh, compact uh, crossover, and um, you know uh, these model, these particular vehicles. You know, there's no plans specifically to produce them exactly as they are. These are just examples of what can be done with their platform. But <clears throat> excuse me, like uh, one of the first companies planning to use uh, the uh, the Foxconn MIH platform is co a company called Fisker, um, which is based in California. Uh, own uh it's um ceos and designers uh henrik fisker he's a famous uh automotive designer and uh, uh fisker back in uh 2008 9 introduced uh, a car called the fisker karma which uh was gorgeous but uh was woefully under engineered uh when fisker was trying to do everything in-house and you know trying to be vertically integrated and it didn't work out so well for them um and uh, they ended up going bankrupt in 2012, 2013, 2013. Uh, and so um, uh, Fisker restarted a new company uh, a few years ago, uh, Fisker Inc. And um, they're working with another company called Magna. Uh, Magna is one of the top three automotive suppliers globally. Uh, and one of their divisions is a company called Magna Steer. Um, based in uh, in Austria, in Graz, Austria, and Magnus, and they they're going to be they did most of the engineering, and they're going to be building the Fisker Ocean uh, that goes into production in a few weeks' time uh, in Austria. It's it's a midsize electric crossover that Fisker is going to sell. It should be arriving here in the U.S. Uh, early in the new year, and uh, the uh, but Magna, you know, they they have a history of building. All kinds of stuff. They they build the Jaguar I Pace. They build a variety of other vehicles for BMW. They've built vehicles for Aston Martin, for Chrysler, Jeep, um, at Mercedes Benz. Um, they they build the Mercedes G Wagon. If you've ever lusted after a Mercedes G Wagon SUV, that's built by Magna Steer in Graz. Uh, so they build stuff for a wide variety of automakers. You know some that you know have you know, the expertise to build on their own, most of which have the expertise to build on their own. They're mostly established automakers, but they just, you know, maybe needed some extra production capacity, not enough to justify building a whole new plant. So they go to, they go to Magna and do that. I think that's what we're going to see happening with uh, Fisker uh, or, or with uh, Foxconn. Foxconn recently bought, um, they, they bought the uh, Lordstown assembly plant, which was formerly, uh, a GM assembly plant in Lordstown, Ohio, near Cleveland. Uh, it had been basically given to a startup called Lordstown Motors uh, during the prior administration in Washington uh, under a lot of political pressure. Um, and Lordstown Motors plans to build an electric pickup truck, which we'll see if it ever actually gains any real traction. Um, 
but that Lordstown Motors was running out of money. Uh, so they did a deal with Foxconn to sell them the factory and lease back some of the floor space to do the manufacturing of the Lordstown Endurance pickup truck. But Foxconn also plans to use that factory for production of vehicles for Fisker and potentially for other manufacturers. Uh, so Fisker's second generation product, called, uh, which is currently under the codename Project Pair, which is an acronym uh, pairs an acronym for something that I can't remember, um, but it'll be a less expensive EV that they plan to have Foxconn build for them in Lorestown, Ohio. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if other other brands, you know, come up and say, hey, you know, we want to build a, a pickup truck, they they have the option to use that same platform and Foxconn could build it for them in Ohio or or somewhere else as well. So, that's Foxconn, and uh, I'm going to give it back to Leo. Uh, Thank you, my friend. I will friend. talk to you all in two weeks. Appreciate your uh, continued support. <laughs> my pleasure. And I will catch you on the flip-flop. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. There is, if there is one negative to the Chromebook, uh, it is that they have an end of life. They call it end of support. End of life is kind of over dramatic. They have an end of support. Uh, and you can see it on any Chromebook, in th at least in theory. I'm not sure why D was having uh, trouble, but you could see it in theory if you, uh, if you go to, I guess maybe it's under the, the help. I'm not sure exactly, but it is it is absolutely possible to uh, to find that information um, in your about Chrome OS. And uh, Ash Potatoes posted this in our uh, Discord, and uh, I'm looking at it right now. About Chrome OS, it's got see what's new, get help with Chrome OS, report an issue, diagnostics, firmware updates, and then un additional details with a little arrow. And then when you click that little arrow, you'll see which channel you're on, your update schedule. And then it says this device will get automatic software and security updates until, and then that date <laughs> is the key. And my suspicion is it stopped getting updates. I wish Google had been more forthright about this. I think they assume, look, they're engineers. You, almost always I, I ascribe to... Uh, any Google flaw, the problem that it's just engineers. They don't understand how humans are. <laughs> they're just they're just robots. And uh, engineers understand, look, at some point, you know, we got a team that's working to keep this up to date. But at some point, we're going to have to say, okay, enough. Every, I mean, you'd agree with that. But, but the question is when that point is. Is it 30 years? <laughs> well, probably not. 10 years, maybe. Five, four, three, two, one. You know, with your phone, you're lucky to get three years of Android updates and five years of security updates. That's pretty typical on a phone, right? On iOS, it's about the same. It's a little longer. But every company, Windows, iOS, Android, every company, every operating system has some drop dead date where, you know, we can't keep working on this. We got, we got other things to do. So it's always important to understand when your end of, support happens on the Chromebook. It's gotten longer. I think it's now up to eight years, uh, with Google's, uh, encouragement, but it's kind of up to the manufacturer as well. So it's worth checking that before you buy and, uh, be aware of it so that when that day comes and suddenly you can't do banking or whatever, that's what's going on. It's just out of date. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. We go back to the lines, and Lex is on the line from Richmond, VA. Hello, Lex. Hello, Leo. I'm genu genuflecting to the West. In your honor. Thank you <laughs> I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. It's okay. You don't need to do that. <laughs> pull, pull up your security breaches. I've got another one that relates to end of life for you. Okay. Uh, is there any way to safely use a no longer supported phone? So, in other words, if you yes. don't do these three or four things, it should be safe to continue to use it. 
you know, a, th- a few moments of silence for my Pixel 3a, but they've they've cut that. Oh, it kills me. They did that to the Pixel 4, too. And uh, what a great yeah. phone the Pixel 4 was. Uh, so that's a perfect example. They've extended the, the uh, support time now on modern Pixel phones, but on the Pixel mm. 3a and the 4, yeah, you're end of life. So, can you use this safely? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, Is it even safe to use it browsing at home, for example? Uh, on your Wi-Fi, you're saying? Yeah. Here's the problem with this. Uh, most, I have to say, most of the problems that happen on uh, smartphones don't come in through the Internet. They come in through you downloading an app. In fact, we just learned uh, that Google has yet another problem in the uh, Android space. Um, let me, I forgot what the, uh, what the, let me see what I can, uh, I just saw this article. Um, Android ad- adware apps and Google Play downloaded over 20 million times. Researchers at McAfee have pinpointed, I think, six different apps. Uh that one's a currency converter, one is a barcode or a QR code creator, one's called High Speed Camera, one's Flashlight Plus. You can see these are kind of dopey mm. apps. And what they do is they install in the background, uh, you don't even see it. They they download ads and click on them in the background. They're just using your phone. They're called clicker apps. They're using your phone to make money uh, in fake in fake ad clicks. Could slow you down. Doesn't really. It's not a security issue. But you don't want that having right. happening. So, by the way, that happens even if you have an absolutely up to date phone. So most mal- malware now on on Android comes through the App Store. Hmm. Uh, so that's job one. I would be, <laughs> you, you know, these are all dopey apps. Get apps only from Google and other, you know, Microsoft, other well known places. And I'd be careful on a out of date phone installing apps. Surfing is a little bit of a problem in theory because you can go to a site that has some malicious software on it. Sometimes these are completely legit sites, by the way. It's not safe. It's not enough to say, oh, only go to well known sites because well known sites can also be hacked. And if it's been hacked, or there could be ads on it that are that are malicious. Uh, and if those are malicious, in theory, you could have what's called a zero-click exploit. Now, I don't think these are very common, even on Android. Generally, if somebody discovers a zero-click exploit, they sell it to a company like Pegasus, uh, like the Israeli company, that then sells it for a million bucks to a nasty nation state. They're too valuable to just use against you. In other words, right. so yeah. I would still be very careful about clicking links and messages. You know, a lot of those messages, text messages or Facebook messages you get are really malware. You know that already. You probably see a lot of them that are malware. Sure. Don't click yeah. those links. You know, don't, you know, <laughs> those could be really deadly. Uh, surf to, you know, stay with well-known sites. You're less likely to get infected there. Uh, but the main thing is not to install malware. Now, what's going to happen, though, is the same thing that happened to D, which is your browser isn't going to be up to date. So there, you may start, and, right. and your banking app will stop working, things like that. So having a phone as a spare, just to get yourself home if you're out on travel. Yeah, that's a good use for it. Down, yeah. As long as you use it as a phone and texting family. Yeah, that's a great use for it. The other thing you can do with many Android phones that will keep it up to date, believe it or not, is... Uh, is root it, get root control over the phone, which you can do with most uh, Android phones, and then install a more up-to-date firmware. There's lots of third-party firmware for Android phones. Google uh, doesn't really lock you out of these phones in the same way that Apple does. So depending on the make and manufacturer and how the manufacturer feels about you rooting the phone, this may be easy to do. Uh, usually involves connecting it to a computer, running some software, and then you can put alternative, what they call ROMs, alternative firmware on there. And there are lots yeah. of them. Some of them are very, very good, actually. Uh, most of Because uh, Android is open source, they take the Android open source and they add features or so forth, and they keep it up to date. So that's another option. But if you just want to put an emergency phone in the car, yeah, old Android, fine. Well, that's, that's good help, Leo. Thank you for that. Yeah, my pleasure. It's actually a very good question. I think this whole thing, it's funny that we're on this topic, but it's really true that uh, uh, it's 
kind of too bad because the hardware, there's nothing wrong with the hardware. On Dee's Chromebook or on Lex's Android phone, they're working. You know, it's a, you don't want to put them in the landfill. They're working. They're fine. In fact, solid-state electronics, if they don't go bad initially, there's no moving parts. They, they, they will last a long time. In fact, the only thing that goes out really on these is the, uh, is the battery. The chips themselves can go on for a century or longer. So if you can replace the battery, yeah, that phone, you could keep using it. You could be using it in 2055. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the software does go bad. 8888-ASK-LEO. It's a good idea, probably, to understand how that happens, what you can do about it. So it's a good question, Lex. I appreciate it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls to come right after this. Hey, Chris Marquardt. Hello. How, How are you doing? You? I am well. I'm doing fine. Good. I'm very fine. What should we talk about today? You have an email. I want to talk about fall weather. Mm. It's spooky season. It's getting gray and overcast and rainy and foggy. Do so, you, uh, you? Did you get a new computer? It looks like you're still on the old one. I am. I am. It's going to be delivered tomorrow, so next week we should be back to, back to the good camera I, and everything. I think you jinxed me because I what? poured a cup of coffee into my MacBook Pro 14. What? My, my M1 MacBook Pro. Yes. I'm very sad. And that is not nice. Not nice. And no. uh, I, uh, I, I brought it into the repair shop, and the guy said, uh, yeah, what you, I still smell the coffee. I said, yeah. He said, "Yeah, well, that uh, usually means it's been marinating in it. What we uh, what we have here is a tier four condition." I said, a "Tier four, huh?" He said, "Yes, that means uh, you're going to have to get a new motherboard, new logic board that starts at thirteen hundred bucks." Uh, and I said, "That's a that's a, at least four tiers. That's quite a few tiers." So, Burke, I, I brought it. I said, "Okay, thank you. Never mind." I brought it uh, to Burke. He took it apart, and he sent me a picture. Actually, I was kind of looking for this. He sent me a picture of one of the chips that is very no. definitely melted. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, you know, you st the problem with the lap these Mac laptops, you can't remove power. So. Uh, oh, so so you got a short circuit in that. Yeah, it just something? melted okay. the uh, mm. melted the switch, and that was that. So <laughs> I have. I also had to order a new laptop. What did you get? Or are you getting yours fixed? Well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a. I'm, I'm, I'm tossing my iMac Pro out, which is my last Intel machine. Here, oh, that's so, right. Uh, that's it's going right. to be an M2 MacBook Air. For nice. Respect. That's what I got it's too. It's faster than the iMac Pro. It's faster than the iMac Pro. And I know. Isn't that fans. depressing? Everybody. No, it's cool. I think it's cool. Everybody uh, who has that M2 Air is l like literally like romantically in love with it micah yeah, pro doc probably. rock probably i don't have it yet i don't have did it you yet, get midnight but... uh no of course not because of the fingerprints so of course not i still wanted midnight so i got it and i got a case you know a cover to put in it so so what why did you get midnight if you've covered it up i got a clear case <laughs> still i know it's dopey i know Mine comes oh, Wednesday. No. I was sad though. I loved. Tomorrow. I really did. I understand why people love it because I loved that M1 MacBook Pro. It was fantastic. Well, I'm still on an M1 MacBook Air here, which is still wonderful to work with. Just not quite. Yeah. Fast enough. Are you at an Intel? I got the. Is it Intel? No, no, no. That's an M1, but it's it's the tiniest spec that I could get because I just needed a travel laptop, right. nothing fancy for travel. But now it's my main machine, and it's a. Bit too small with eight gigabytes of RAM, yeah. but oh hey, yeah, you have the base model. It still does the job. It still can stream. That's so. my uh, my um, excuse of or kind of consolation at getting rid of the fourteen. In order to get it quickly, I got the base model, uh, and now which is totally now fine for for most things you'll use. Yeah. It. If you don't yeah. use it in a, in, a, in a video editor fashion, then right. that's totally fine. I'm looking forward to this air. Yeah. So. 
All right, we'll talk in a few. Next weekend, we'll exchange experiences. Yes, it'll be so much fun. (laughs) Talk to you in a bit. Our show today brought to you by Mint Mobile. We talk all the time about wireless carriers. I really got to say, for most people, Mint Mobile is the perfect solution. Premium wireless from Mint Mobile starting at just $15 a month. Now, just to put that into perspective, just go take a look at your cellular bill. It's probably seven or eight times higher. And now for the plot twist. There isn't one. (laughs) There's no catch. Mint Mobile, yes, charges a sixth of what the other guys do or less. Premium wireless, $15 a month. No trapping you into a two-year contract. You open the bill, you're not going to see a lot of crazy hidden fees. There's no luring you in with free subscriptions on streaming services. You'll forget to cancel and then be charged full price for. No, 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 there's none of that. There's just great service. I have a Mint Mobile on my iPhone SE, which I got from them, by the way, for $15 a month. So for a brand new phone and brand new service, unlimited nationwide text and talk, a huge amount of data, I pay 30 bucks a month. That's including the phone. 15 bucks a month if you want to bring your own. Mint Mobile now does eSIMs, so they make it very easy if you've got a new iPhone to sign up for Mint Mobile. They don't even have to mail you a SIM. If you need a SIM, they'll send you one free of charge. And Mint Mobile will always give you the best rate, whether you're buying for one or for a family. At Mint, families are two lines or more. All plans come with unlimited talk and text high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number, port it right over along with your contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile. Get premium wireless service starting at 15 bucks a month with no catches. It's such a good deal. It really, for most people, is the only way to go. Get premium wireless from $15 a month. I actually decided to get the bigger plan. They have an unlimited plan. I decided to kind of split the difference, paid for a whole year. It was It's an unbelievable deal. No unexpected plot twists. Mintmobile.com slash tech guy. Mintmobile.com slash tech guy. Your wallet will be smiling. They really will be. Uh, and I'll be smiling if you use that address so they know you saw it here. Mint Mobile, M I N T, because it's minty fresh. Yes, that's the one Ryan Reynolds does the ads for. Same one. Mintmobile.com slash tech guy. I guess he's the owner. Uh, and you know what I like about him? He's decided to make this, do it right. A, a great company doing great service at an amazing price. Mintmobile.com slash tech guy. Thank you, Mint Mobile, for supporting the show. Now back to the calls. Brazil. Oh. Ah, it's Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> I actually like the ZZ Top version of this. Maybe a little better than. The, no, you like the Elvis version better, huh? Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Bill is next from Goleta, California. Hello, Bill. Hello, Leo. How are you this fine day? I am great. How are you? I am good. Good. I found a bargain on the internet, and I got Uh-oh. a... Uh-oh. That's always... <laughs> that's a bad way to begin it. Okay. I Okay. <laughs> bargain. Okay. Oh, an OLED TV. Oh, good. I was playing with it. Yeah. And it says you can... Do Bluetooth, so I bought an adapter for my Bose uh, Quad Quiet Comfort 15. Oh, nice! That works good. Good, but it won't do the speakers and the Bluetooth. Oh, you want your wife to be able to listen to the speakers while you wear the headphones? Yeah, you know. That's so a, that's a sensible thing. Good. Yeah. Yep. They're do, they're trying to do you a favor because uh, a lot of times. You know, I also get calls from people saying, I don't want, I want to use my Bluetooth speakers. I don't want to hear the TV speaker. So they're cutting off the TV speaker. That probably is not something it has to do. So have you dug through the settings? I tried and looked and didn't find anything. The only thing, you know, is friend of mine, I don't know what brand he has, but his wife has hearing aids that do Bluetooth and, you know, she can connect to her TV. Yeah, so I'm yeah. wondering if I can do that too, but it doesn't look like it. So um, let me just look because Scooter X has given me an article from LG. Oh, ah, Us- it's an LG. Yeah, using headphones and TV speakers at the same time. He has 
a 55 C6P. Uh-oh, I've got a 42 C2. Okay, but it's probably the same. So, according to LG, uh, settings, you go to settings, all settings, sound, sound yeah. out, and there's an option at the bottom to select internal TV speaker plus wired headphones. You might try... Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, you might try yeah. try that. Okay. Um, that sounds good. Then there's another, there's another uh, guy... I want to. You know what I'll do is I. We will put this in the show notes so you can look at this thread that I'm looking at. Who says if you wish to use Bluetooth and the internal speakers, first pair the Bluetooth. Uh, yeah. Press and hold the cog button. Select sound. Select sound out. Scroll down to Bluetooth. Select the device list. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. So it's in the sound configuration menu. Scroll down to Bluetooth surround sound plus internal TV speakers. So in both these cases, you can go to the menu and make sure that the internal speakers are turned on. There's one other thing I would say that I discovered on my own, and I've seen since it con seen, since seen it confirmed, that sometimes when you're messing with the TV sound settings and the various things, it gets confused. And there is also in the menu a reset command. Don't do this until you've tried everything and you're actually tearing your hair out. <laughs> but but there is a reset command that resets all of the settings back to the factory original settings. Okay. And I have found with both my LGs and with my Samsungs that occasionally it gets confused. I particularly have one TV. It's actually a Panasonic, but one TV that you'll set it up and I know everything's set right and it doesn't work. I do a reset. I now yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, you have to go back through all the settings and redo them because that's what reset does. But then that works. So okay. I, I do think sometimes a reset is required just because the TV it seems to get confused. So the first but the first okay. thing to do is go into the menu, the sound menu, and make sure internal TV speakers are turned on. And it looks like on some TVs you'll see Bluetooth surround sound plus internal speakers as a choice, and you okay. click that uh, and it should work. Because these Bluetooths, well, I have these headphones, they're not really, you know, five plus one or whatever. You know, that's fine. You know, left and no, right. yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, and it'll sound great because you have the quiet comfort, you'll have the noise cancellation. Uh, I think that's a great way to do it. I do, I do that with my LG and my uh, Apple AirPods, but I'm using the Apple TV and the AirPods pair to the Apple TV. And uh, the okay. same, same idea. Uh, and I'm trying to remember if uh, if that cuts off the speaker. I think it does. But in this case, I'm doing it so I don't wake up my wife. <laughs> oh, so oh. Just tell your wife, go to sleep, and it won't be a problem, right. Bill. That's it, true. <laughs> so I think, you can, I think you can do it. You just have to find the right setting. <laughs> okay. Hey, a pleasure talking I to you. One more question. Yes, sir. Your DJI, on your DJI Mini 3? Love my Mini 3. Yes, sir. Uh, you haven't crashed it yet. <laughs> no, you know why? I've only flown it a few times. <laughs> I'm too scared. Are you, because of the weight, are you restricted by No. That? It's one can... gram less than the FAA yeah. limit. Yeah. So you, can, you can't go near an airport. It still has those geographic, you know, geofencing. But you don't have to register it with the FAA to fly it. But what about your 200 feet high? Are you limited to whatever the FAA says? Oh, that's an interesting question. It does feel a lot now if you can't go to the airport, so it probably doesn't. Yeah, probably. Like 200 is uh, pretty high feet. anyway. I generally, you know, at that point I'm losing sight of it, and that, that also makes yeah. me. I've flown it yeah, pretty high. It. I've flown it well over 100 feet, and then yeah. it's just a little speck. So <laughs> I think maybe I've been reluctant to fly it higher. I'll try it tonight. You gave me a reason to. Somebody's yeah. saying it's limited to 400 foot. Rockabilly well, Hog. That's, that's FAA, but yeah, yeah. He yeah. says the Mini Three has a it does have the four hundred foot limit. Yeah, that's fine. Four hundred feet is so high. Uh, yeah, you can't see it. Yeah, you can't see it, and it, you know it's. I guess it'd be kind of cool to see the view from four hundred feet up, but mostly I like to have a kind of hundred foot view. You know, kind of close yeah. close to the earth. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a camera on a ladder. It's so cool. And I've, I've, I've done the selfie thing. Do you have one, Bill? I have a Phantom 4. Oh, you have a nice one. 
You have the fancy one. Well, it's it's big and heavy, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I turned off once, being brave, the anti-collision system because uh-huh. it will prohibit you from flying into an area where it, it can't, uh, it's too close, it thinks it's too close to the trees, and I wanted to go yeah. in amongst the trees. That was a scary uh-huh. moment. <laughs> yeah. I regretted yeah. it instantly, <laughs> but I didn't hit anything yeah. yet. I'm so far. What do you use yours for, Bill? Oh, just looking and doing, you know, not much. I know I was flying it. And it semi-crashed, but not really. Somehow it was landing where, you know, I pushed the button, say to land. It landed, but it didn't land where it was supposed to. Yeah. Over a little ways, and it got entangled with a tree. Yikes. Broke one, broke one propeller, and then, it, you know, I was able to control it, get it up, and I grabbed it. And I landed it. it. It cracked the body a little, but you know it. You it, know what they say: any landing you can walk away from is a is a good landing. <laughs> well, Gil, I hope you got it fixed up. It's a it's a it was so much fun to play with. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls coming up. Chris Marquart too. You should do a segment on uh, high altitude photography, drone photography. That'd be kind of fun. That would be kind of fun. Do you have a drone? Yeah, an Air 2. Mm. Fancy. Do you use it? Mm. Only when I travel, which yeah. means I haven't used it in two years. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. So, you kind of have to have um, an excuse yeah, around, to use it. Because I've seen, I've I, now seen our have, neighborhood I'm, from the air. <laughs> that's that's the same thing here. We have some really nice forests and things and trees and stuff on, out in the field. And that's nice and good, but then i've seen it in 12 different light conditions so. yeah, exactly now i'm done yeah i'm done and 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 of course aimlessly shooting drone footage what are you going to use it for so you right. need an application for it you need to have a project where you need drone footage but then you can't make it all drone footage because then it's going to get boring again so drone footage should yeah. in my view be a, supp- it's a really supplement like film, to it's other now you're footage. filmmaking which is a whole another thing Right. Uh, Drones, as much fun as they are, they, um, if people are not really, if people don't have a real need for them, they will turn into paperweights. Yep. Same thing for 360 degree cameras. I have several of them. Yeah. You need a project for it. You need a project for it. Otherwise it's not, it's going to be fun for a short while. And then that's it. Remember Lytro, the first one, the the lipstick size of form factor refocusing camera. Um, that was fun for five minutes, and then yeah. it was a cool, a cool technical a tech demo. But I, everyone I know who got one of those didn't use it. Yeah, exactly. Well, in fact, I saw somebody who worked on the Lytra team tweeted about it, saying the problem was you had to be pr- you had it was like almost like macro, right? You had to be pretty close to the subject to take advantage of the multiple that fields. too and yeah and if you need you need a, an application for it no yeah. killer app yet yeah. for these uh, for, for many things yeah so. they're toys with in other words <laughs> oh and it's fun to play it's awesome to play but yeah. not yeah i mean it's an expensive toy let's put it yeah uh-huh tis all right we shall talk in moments i'll be here I, you know, seeing the iPad announcement, I think it was they were right not to because that was all over. That was that really wasn't worth doing an event for. And maybe the Max won't be either. I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe they're not ready. Mama, don't take my coat of chrome. It's time for our photo guy, Chris Marquardt. He joins us every week to help us get better uh, pictures. Thank you, Chris Marquardt, for doing that. You'll find him at sensei.photo, and he still hosts the longest-running, right? Longest-running photography show in the world of podcasts. Tips from the top floor, TFTTF. It's been going so long, no one remembers what the top floor was or why we got tips from it. But I moved. I moved twice since. <laughs> He's <laughs> since no he longer on the top floor. The top floor. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in fact on the ground floor in the viewfinder villa right now. Tips from the viewfinder <laughs> villa now. Yeah, uh, but go to, ring, go to go to no <laughs> sensei dot photo s e n s e i dot photo to find out more about Chris to see some of his lovely photos. Every week he inspires us 
to take better pictures with a topic. What is the topic this week? Well, I was out this afternoon. We did a little walk, um, just a Sunday walk, and I noticed that well, we're heading into fall oh, and the weather yes. is changing. So yeah. I want to, I want to bring, I want to talk about three different weather situations, weather conditions that you might come across in fall, at least on the northern hemisphere. hemisphere um, that uh, yeah are very special and what you can do with them photographically or what to look out for. So the first one. I want to talk about is overcast weather. I've put together a little gallery that um, you can put on the website as a link. Um, so overcast weather, the general issue with overcast weather is that um, it's not the flat light that can be really lovely. It's the gray, boring sky very often. And a good way to deal with that is if you have something interesting in the background and maybe not even have to show the sky. Um, Here's a bit of a landscape shot, and it has these this little mountain range in the back. And uh, if you if you have something in the back that covers up the sky, that works well. Also works well to um, if you're taking pictures of let's say people and so on to raise yourself up just a little bit above them so that you're not shooting at the sky. You're shooting from above and you hide the sky. That's uh, that's a good that's a good um, way to. Not really show that sky. You can do a lot with photos that have flat lights. I've done that trick several times. We did a photo uh, safari to Tasmania in Australia, and it was overcast the entire two weeks. So, yeah, yeah, you got to find something else to take a picture of. (laughs) Or you lean into it really well, like this photo here of a bus stop with a lot of of empty sky. But that is kind of the thing about this photo. It's more of a... More of a of a negative space photo, even over overexposed the sky, which I think gives it really nice spacing in the photo. I love these kind of photos, very reduced, um, which is what happens. I get chilly when I look at these. I start <laughs> it's cold. It just looks cold. <laughs> oh, you Californians! <laughs> yeah, I can't handle it, man. I can't handle it. <laughs> Well, second second kind of um, Ooh, I like this. situation that you might encounter in fall is rainy yeah. weather. Yeah. And uh, th- th- so so one thing that I love in cities is, um, or in general in photos, is you, things that pop up multiple times in the same, same shot. So uh, in this case, the umbrellas, they have, it's like a unifying element between the subjects in the picture. Everyone's having an umbrella in their hand. That is pretty cool. Um, the other thing, of course, is reflections. Um, I sometimes go out after the rain, just after the rain, stop so I don't get wet, but still those reflections are there. And uh, if you go out um, in, in let's say, uh, areas where, where there's a tiled floor, like, like rock tiles, you get these puddles standing on these that give you almost like a like a mirror reflection. Reflections you go so low great. down. That is so, so beautiful. Yeah. If you do that at night, you get this amazing look of mm. colors of different lights reflecting. And that's what they, in, in Hollywood, they love doing that. It's called a wet down when they shoot at night. Often they wet the road because you get these gorgeous reflections and interesting kind of uh, light effects there. So uh, rainy weather. One of my favorites. And during the rain, yeah, of course, hey, your cameras, you and your camera are not made of sugar. Um, I, <laughs> well, <I> still... well, <laughs> some well, cameras do not would... like a lot of water, I confess. <laughs> I would, if, uh, mo- most cameras nowadays, especially the higher tier ones, are. Um, yeah, check are first, I guess. Yeah. Um, of course, check first. But uh, I've seen, you know, what, what I usually have in my pocket? Usually I have in my pocket one of these. Um, Oh, do I have one around? No, I don't. Oh, yes, I do. A little mini one umbrella? No, microfiber cloth. Oh, yeah, yeah. A yeah. microfiber cloth that you would usually use in the kitchen. And that is super handy to just dry it on the camera after a few drops of rain. Carry Shall that I? with so, you. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's the second one. Let's talk about, briefly talk about the third weather condition that is fog. Ooh. Fog. Ooh. I call fog the big cleaner because it cleans out pictures it takes detail out of pictures and makes them yeah less busy less distracting it takes distractions out um it can create beautiful silhouettes again against a foggy background so you have a very different 
a setup of contrast that you would usually have. Um, it adds some mystery to photos. Here's a here's a windmill, and it kind of grows out of the fog. So um, mystery, especially in this month, is very very welcome. Um, the next thing that fog does, we talked about this in the past, is volume light. So it gives light a shape. Light becomes, you see the cones of light coming from light sources. You see halos around lights and that, yeah, it, it, light has a has a, a body that you can almost touch. I love this. Um, this is very moody. This looks like it could be a Humphrey Bogart movie or something. Yes. Um, fog also takes the background out. So it makes, it cleans it up. Um, and if you combine that, if you combine the the almost natural black and white that you get in fog, because it, it yeah it, it takes out a lot of the color contrast with some strong colors, then you have a winner. So, yeah. sodium lamps there giving that orange cast. That's pretty still cool. Still a few around. They're getting replaced with LEDs, but yeah. there's still a few around. Yeah. So. yeah. Very nice. It's so, so that's fun. The combination. See, Chris is yeah. inspiring us to not be dismayed by gloomy weather but to go out there and capture some gloom in fact this would be a good time to take your uh, camera out and get your assignment shots because what is the subject of the month mysterious mysterious, mysterious. so perfect for spooky season Go out and take a mysterious picture. Now, we're, there's no prize. This isn't a competition. We just want to give you an excuse to, to take pictures. And by the way, you don't need a fancy camera by any means. Uh, in, in, in months past, plenty of smartphone cameras have been selected. Uh, just take your, take your picture when you get one. And you can only submit one a week. So really, with your best picture of the week, submit it to the Tech Guy group on Flickr. Flickr.com. If you're not already a member, join the Tech Guy group. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will accept your photo if you tag it TG Mysterious so that she knows it's for this month's assignment. TG Mysterious. I. It seems like this one, it, you should have no trouble during spooky season. To find that, should be easy. that should be super that should be easy. easy. Yeah. Go to a pumpkin patch or something. There's going to be something you could do. <laughs> and, this has to be a mysterious pumpkin patch. <laughs> uh, Chris Marquardt is at sensei.photo. He's got, there's so many things to, to plug for Chris besides the tips from the Top Floor podcast. He has other podcasts, the Future of Photography podcast. He also has two, more than two, but two books I love, the Film Book and the Wide Angle Book. Uh, you can find out about his workshops, uh, get his coaching. It's all at sensei.photo, S-E-N-S-E-I dot photo. And we will put a link to this great gallery of moody, mysterious rainy and foggy and gloomy pictures up on our website techguylabs.com chris do you celebrate halloween in germany most people do i'm not really not you this. though okay <laughs> <laughs> well i'll see you next week for halloween bye see you then <laughs> <laughs> do they you have trick-or-treaters yes they come around, huh? Wanting candy. Yes, they do. It's amazing. Yes, I mean, well, it's 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 one of it's one of those holidays that we imported from you Americans. Yeah, you although <laughs> All Hallows Eve is, I mean, you know, there's a Day of the Dead in uh, in Mexico. Yeah, and, I know, but 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 the but the whole the whole trick or treat the, the whole trick or treat I think is ours. Yeah, That's a very yeah. American thing. That's yeah. ours. <laughs> Give me candy or I'll egg your house. That's definitely ours. Yeah, I know they're not quite that aggressive here. So it's all good. <laughs> well, have it's all fun. Good. But that reminds me that I have to get some candy in case kids show up. Oh, I know. We're we're lucky. We I we have never had a trick or treater come to our house. Really? Yeah, we've lived there for almost ten years now. Else? Um, no, it's just the middle of nowhere, and and nobody comes that way. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, <laughs> Petaluma now does <laughs> a downtown. You go around downtown with your kids because it's safer. So they do a downtown trick or treat. I think people are so nervous these days that they don't let their kids out as yeah, much as they used to. Yeah, interesting, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, we're really a scared, scared country. And for good reason, probably. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Chris. Have a great week. Thank you. See Take care. Bye-bye. Now, that's a happy song. Is that from 1938?
This is <laughs> might as well be. This is episode 1938, TechGuyLabs.com, the website. Leo Laporte, your tech guy. If you want to talk, let's talk tech. The good day to do it is when the NFL is playing. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Call 8888-ASK. Leo, Darren is on the line from Portland, Oregon. Hello, da uh, Darren. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. What can um, I do for you? I have a, uh, I've got some older equipment. I have, a, you know, a standard $50 modem from five or six years ago and a, <laughs> a hand-me-down router. Uh, the router seems to be in decent working order, but um, every, about, I've been working from home a little bit more, um, every hour or so, the signal will drop off. I get that freeze. I can count it down six, seven seconds. I'm back up and running. Interesting. Once an hour. Much bigger problem. Uh, yeah, about there, yeah. Every every 45 minutes or so. Yeah. My son, it's a bigger problem for my son because... He's gaming. Gaming, <laughs> gaming is a big problem. Yeah, for a few seconds later, and you're not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we've been just dealing with it. I, inevitably, I think I just need to buy a new router or buy a new modem or want... Buy yeah. A, they're so old. I figure it's time for so both of them. But there's a is it a ca is it is it a cable uh, internet or is it from the phone company? Yeah, no, it's it's cable. Cable. It's, it's so there's a good reason to get a new cable modem, and probably this is the solution. Uh, the cable technology, which is called DOCSIS, D O C S I S, changes, and it's all in all likelihood, your uh, cable provider is offering DOCSIS three connectivity, which would be much faster than uh doxis two or one uh if you have a really old cable modem i bet it's not doxis three or th the current is doxis 3.1 and these newer doxis protocols allow them to go much faster so that would be the compelling reason a, a new cable modem will cost you anywhere from 100 to 200 dollars you save the money back if you're paying rent on the cable company's modem, and they're not allowed to charge you rent for your own modem. So yeah. that seven to ten dollars a month will will make itself. Yeah, I've, I've always purchased, so I had it. You know, oh, my own. it's yours. Uh, I see. The, yeah, I'm look. I'm looking at the stupid old modem right now. Uh, one of the, you know, it's it gives all the. You know, recycle information on the bottom. Is D 3.0, is that DOCSIS 3.0? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay. Well, so, so that's probably enough, although some cable companies have moved to DOCSIS 3.1, and there is a definite uh, speed improvement. It, you know, remember, you're only getting the speed you pay for. So mm -hmm. speed, it sounds like speed is not the issue. The dropout is this issue. The dropout can happen from either the router or the modem. It's interesting that it happens like clockwork and that it comes back is a little puzzling. It could be heat. Um, cable modems and routers are cheap computers, basically, usually fanless, and they usually get quite hot. I'd feel I'd I'd touch the router and the modem when they do go down just to see if they're if they're burning, blazing hot. If they are, then that's probably the cause of it. If, if it turns off for a few seconds, it cools off very quickly and then can go back to operation until it overheats again. Uh, I figured it's time to throw both of them in the fire anyway. So. It might not be a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How big is your house? How many square feet? Uh, I don't know, 1,200 or so. Okay. It's, it's a townhome. It's three-level townhome, so I'm sometimes down in the garage. Three levels can be a problem, depending on how it's built. You know, it could be very hard if the cable modem is in the basement and, and your son is in the third floor. He ain't going to be happy. Yeah. No, we, we have it positioned up here by him so he can <laughs> plug in. Ethernet. He's a teenager, isn't he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's 13. We, we can plug him directly in. Yeah, yes. Uh, and then the rest of us yes, on Wi-Fi. Yes, exactly. Um, that would be a good solution. So, is he on Ethernet? So wait a minute. Is yes, the, he is. It, so it goes down even on the Ethernet. Uh, so he says, yes. Okay, when that's good. His game on his PC. Um, that's good to know because it means Xbox. it's not the Wi-Fi, which, you know, Wi-Fi will go down sometimes. But it's not the Wi-Fi. It's the Internet. So it could be, again, it could either be the cable modem or, or the uh, or the router. Um, yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be bad to get a new one. I, I use a Netgear cable modem, a CMS 1000 that I like a lot. They're uh, just under two just south of two hundred dollars, 
Uh, and they do support Doxis uh, 3.1. You should check with the cable provider before you get a uh, cable modem just to make sure that it's compatible with what they're compatible. offering. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but almost all, as far as I know, every I use I'm Comcast. Almost every cable provider I know works with the very nice Netgear CM1000. Uh, and uh, uh, kudos, to, kudos to Micah uh, for covering for you every time. Every time you're out, he does great. Yeah, I'm really, yeah. He's a, uh, he's the, you know, the future. <laughs> I'm the past. <laughs> and as I, as I get older and older, it gets important to, I think to get somebody with a younger perspective on him. Mike is great. Uh, he's half yeah. my age and twice as smart. So it's exactly what I'm looking for. So well, good. I'm glad you, I'm glad you liked him. Yeah, I appreciate him filling in uh, yesterday so I could go to Las Vegas with my wife. That was very nice. Of him. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and maybe get a new, uh, you know, it might even be a good case uh, for getting a mesh router so that you could have uh, satellites on the other two floors, giving you a little bit yeah. better uh, internet on the other two floors. But he's got, he's hardwired. He's getting the best internet you've got. And uh, and if it's still dropping out, yeah, it's time to get some. one of the, one of those two is superannuated. Probably get both of them, get new ones. It's fine. Can do. Thanks, yep. sir. Yeah, I like the Asus, uh, ASUS uh, routers, but if you're going to get mesh, I think Eero is probably the way to go. Eero or Netgear's Orbi. Uh, the Orbis are slightly faster. The Eeros are slightly smarter. So there are a couple of recommendations. And it might even be worth going to the Wirecutter, uh, wirecutter.com. They are uh, the New York Times kind of consumer reports-like service, and they do... Uh, I think a pretty good job. They're not super, super, super technical. So sometimes I think they maybe miss the boat on some of their uh, uh, reviews and ratings. But I think you can trust them for uh, for routers. Let me just see what they recommend. The gear to get reliable Wi-Fi in any home. Ah, but I see it wasn't updated till Feb. It's more than a year. It's February sixteenth, twenty twenty one. Oh, but they have updated it with new picks. They like the TP Link Archer. They've always liked that one. Hmm. I wonder what they like for mesh. 8888 Ask Leo. I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader. Jim is on the line from Calabasas, California. Hi, Jim. Oh, hi, Leo. Just want to compliment you on your great program. Thank you. I appreciate your listening. And I do have a question, if you have a moment. Sure. I'd like to ask about when does one need to update their drivers on their computer. I was under the impression that Windows 10 updates, uh, when you get the Windows updates for 10, that they uh, update the drivers in the computer at the same time. Every time I turn my computer on, I get the ad for uh, from updateyourdrivers.com. No. So that's malware. Do not. Do not. Do not yeah. do that. Uh, if you're getting drivers from anybody but the manufacturer, there's always the risk it could have malware. And uh, a bad, a malicious driver is really a bad news situation because drivers have access, full access to the the memory of the computer, including Ring Zero. So that's really a bad thing to get a malicious driver on there. Do not get drivers from UpdateDrivers.com or anywhere else. Get them either from Microsoft or the manufacturer and nowhere else. Microsoft Windows does update drivers, but they do some interesting things. So it's good for you to know. Running your Windows update. And I think, you know, Microsoft says you don't have to run it. Uh, you should just let it go and it'll update itself. And that's probably true. But I run it every once in a while. But here's what I would do. There's an optional updates section. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times drivers are put in the optional updates. In other words, you don't have to do this, but we offer them. I always do it. So go to the advanced options in windows update and go to the optional updates and i would do those every time that will get you the most recent driver leo laporte the tech guy the only downside to brand new fresh drivers is you know if it just came out sometimes they're buggy uh and then that's worth maybe rolling back and it's not too hard to roll back but i think it's worth getting updated drivers when they're available uh, yeah I certainly agree, but I was wondering about the best way to do it. But the uh, Windows 10 updates uh, should include... Yes, they will include uh, all the updates. And then if you... I guess the rule of thumb is if you're not having problems, don't update drivers. <laughs> That's the rule of thumb. 
But I like to be fresh. <laughs> so I always do. I always look at the optional updates. Uh, those are often driver's updates are put there as well. The Windows update will absolutely give you the critical uh, the driver updates you have to have. Mm -hmm. So okay. if so if there's a bug discovered in a driver uh, or a security flaw, Windows update will push the updated driver. Do not go to a third party. Good to know. Thank you very much, sir. Great question. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. You too. Take care. Bye, Jim. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got smartphones. We've got smart watches. We've got all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number if you want to talk high tech. Tomorrow, big day for Apple users. The new Mac OS is coming out. Mac OS Ventura. And tomorrow, the new iPad OS 16. So um, back up, back up, back up. Prepare yourselves. You don't have to do it, by the way. <laughs> you don't have to do it. You'll still get security updates if you don't update. Most Mac users, most iPhone users do, in fact, update. Very high percentage update immediately. Uh, we are already on iPhone OS 16, but they del delayed the iPad OS 16 because both the new iPad OS and the new Mac OS have this thing called Stage Manager that I hate. <laughs> I think is so dopey. Uh, and I just, I don't think it's going to take off. But, you know, Apple's always looking to do something new and interesting. And this is about Windows management. Window management, not Windows. Window management. And that's an, an idea. I, I can't fault them for coming up with an idea. But, uh, you know, you, you'll be the judge tomorrow. We'll all get the new Mac OS and iPad OS. Ken is on the line from Houston, Texas. Hi, Ken. Hi, Leo. Welcome. I'm from the past, too. <laughs> Most of us from the past have to hang together. I love Roger Waters' music. I love <laughs> cream and, real cream in my coffee. Ah, I mean, you know. You are my man. I love it. <laughs> you, you remember going inside a bank... You remember dialing a phone. You remember the good old days. I remember Christmas Club when I was a kid <laughs> paying 50 cents a week. My... I know. I remember when grocery stores gave you green stamps and you could buy an encyclopedia. <laughs> and and and, and uh, accessories for the kitchen. And that That's right. That Dishes. Was... Grocery stores. Yes. Yes, you would get as a as a reward for shopping there. You can get a set of dishes or a set of encyclopedia. Uh, we still need dishes. I don't think encyclopedias uh, are very popular anymore. Not not real. Well, world. no, I was a librarian when uh, ah. they kind of stopped buying encyclopedias. Yeah, yeah. I I was foolish for my when I growing as a kid. I remember in 1965, my mom and dad bought the World Book. And I loved it. I went through it, you know, cover to cover, would read, you know, volume. I'm going to read volume 10 now. And uh, and I loved it. So when my kids were the same age, I bought them the world book shortly before the Internet took over. <laughs> I, I and they, they never, never used it. They never used it, but I still have it on my shelf as an old timer. It's part of my my job to represent. The good well, old I was angry that my parents didn't buy me the Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> but I was happy to get it because I did what you did. Yeah, and you I learn. That's how you learn. Something else. I wish I was as as competent as you as with dealing with your employees, dealing with oh. callers who need nudging a little bit, or <laughs> you know, you're not arrogant. It's just oh. it's your part Thank of the you. past. <laughs> it is part of the past, isn't it? And you know, it's funny. I've been talking to people now that we're kind of coming out of covid and we i thought people would be kinder and gentler coming out of covid and they're not they're jerks <laughs> we, yeah we forgot yeah. how to relate to one another i don't know what <laughs> their, their social skills are all that's, online yeah that's exactly that's right i, I fear that that's the way it's going to be from now on i know <sighs> i'm glad i'm old <laughs> yeah yeah well, we're, we're let's shout at the clouds you. together, Ken. What can I? What can I do for you? I need. I've got. Why is Why is Apple much simpler to go from an Apple to Apple than Android is from Android to Android? It, it, Are you moving from one Android phone to another? 
Yeah, I've got the Apple to Apple Fine. It's, yeah, it's, Apple makes it very easy. Android now is copying, or I don't know if they're copying. I don't know who came up with it first, but they're doing something similar where uh, when you first turn on a new Android phone, I did this with my Pixel 7 when I got it. It said, all right, do you have an old Pixel phone? Would you yeah, like I to? I have exactly the same phone. I'm moving from one to the other. Because yeah. I broke the oh, okay. And then it says, well, if you got the cable that came with the phone, plug it into both. And it was just a few matter of a few minutes. It copied it right over, and uh, this phone was basically the new phone was basically the same as the old one. Are you moving within from one manufacturer to another? No, it's the same phone. No, same phone exactly. Now, do I? Do so I, that's one thing I have to say. That's one thing that's an issue in the Android world. Apple is the only company that makes iOS, and the only company that makes iPhones. Right. So you get an iPhone. It's an it's an Apple product. Android, you could get Samsung, you could get Xiaomi, you could get Huawei, you can get Google. There's a hundred different manufacturers, and so each of them, it's kind of up up to up to them to how they're going to make how easy or hard they're going to make it to move. It's not up to Google, unfortunately. So I had no trouble moving from Google Phone to Google Phone. Whose phones are you moving from? Motorola to Motorola. And and so it doesn't say when you get. And is the old phone still working or no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just broken screen and battery okay. running up. So generally what I tell people if they're on Google, first of all, is use all the Google services. Use Google Calendar. Use Google Contacts because then it's going to copy that all up to the Google Cloud. So even if you lost a phone or a phone died, all of that stuff is stored safely and can be downloaded. Similarly, turn on the Google Backup. It's in your settings and have it back okay. up to Google. That'll back up most yeah. of your settings to Google. Uh if it, but it doesn't, when you turn on the new Motorola, it doesn't say, do you have, I, I seem to remember it does that. You you have an old Motorola you'd like to connect over? Well, yeah. I mean, no, I, I got one through uh, unclaimed luggage and <laughs> it came and it looked brand new. Make sure you start from scratch. No, do the I factory reset, okay? <laughs> no, that's fine. It's somebody's old phone, but that's why you want to wipe it. I hope you I hope you wipe it first. Oh, it was already wiped. Yeah, it was Some, wiped. Somebody wiped it. it. Okay. Uh, so it should, when it starts up, say, you know, what country are you in? What language do you want to use? All of that, right? Right. And then at no point does it say, do you have a previous phone you'd like to copy the data from? I don't think that's so. That's disappointing. No. Yeah, it might not. Yeah. Um, I'll look for it. I haven't. What I would do is you have your old phone. I know it's hard to use, but you can, if you can, you know, get around the screen cracks and say oh, back, yeah. back up to Google, then just restoring from Google on the new phone will get you 99% of the way there. Now, the question for me is, is the SD card, should I leave it in the old phone? And No, you can take it over. You can bring it over. Okay. Yeah, because it, that, it depends on how you set it up, but usually when you put an SD card in, uh, the first time you take a picture, it says, oh, oh, would you like me to store pictures there instead? And you say, yes, then all your pictures are there. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I yeah, think it should be easy. I think it's clever, though. How do you know what they've got at the Lost and Found to buy it? Is there a, a website? Yeah, it's called the Unclaimed Freight, I think. Oh, that's hysterical. It's Alabama. What a great idea. And the phone is brand new. I mean, it, it's... It was a Google Fi phone, which works on T-Mobile, which is who I use. And uh, oh yeah, I like Google Fi. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, so I'm not on Google Fi, but the, my only concern would be nice. if uh, that phone was marked as lost or stolen. There may uh, the IMEI may be locked somewhere. That mo that it may be that that phone is uh, unusable. You know, they do that. Apple does that. Uh, right with activation I, I, lock, I, and I can return it. That yeah, and, uh, there's no problem with that. Does it is it otherwise operating okay? Oh, it's wonderful. And you were able to get it onto Google Fi network and everything. No, I'm going to go to T-Mobile with oh, my okay. SIM card. Okay, because okay. it's the same network. As, yeah, it's the same network. As as long as it works, uh, then it wasn't deactivated. It's just. You know, maybe you have to it works fine. you have to knock on some things. It's good to talk to so somebody of my generation, though. That's what I'm saying that, Ken. Information. You're in a great <laughs> my pleasure. You, a well, you are a professor. Ken, Ken, have, have you re you've retired from the librarian uh, position? Yeah. How is retirement? Well, 
You know, I miss the kids. I bet. They had, they had librarian, hated kids. They all came to me. Oh. The kids are honest up till about 10 or 12 years old. I agree. That's right. <laughs> yeah, they're great until they hit teen puberty and then it's all over. About, yeah. Yeah, it's sex or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's hilarious. And you have to be careful, you know. You have to be careful. Well, I, you know, maybe you could find a volunteer job that'll get you or get you uh, back in the library. I bet you they, they're. Well, I'm on to dogs now. So. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Dogs are like uh, kids before they're uh, 12. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're all love. Good kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, I'm I'm right I'm right after you. I'm right, I'm coming I'm coming to retirement myself. Okay, uh, that's why I ask. You I just want to make sure. I I might go crazy. I might say might be like Sinatra and unretire three or four times. You never know. Well, get a train set. I think he had a bunch of ministers. electric trains. There you go. You used to have those as a yeah, kid. I, I, I like real trains, but Me I don't too. know why he would be fascinated by Sinatra. Loved trains. I did not know that. Yeah, I and then meanwhile, people like uh, like Mike are saying, "Who's Sinatra?" <sighs> yeah, right. <We're> <sighs> Thanks, <Jesus>. Ken. <laughs> you have a, have a wonderful weekend, uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Uh, we will uh, we will have more of your calls right after this. Stay here. It's a little uh, music from uh, the Katy Perry concert I went to uh, the other night. She had a whole. <laughs> Oh, big band. Da, da, da. Leo Laporte. No, that's not what that's from. That's from 1938, isn't it, Professor Laura? Yes. Music from the episode number. Every uh, We're getting into the, into the 30s now. Soon it's going to be the 40s. Yeah. Will we make it to the 60s? That's the, <laughs> that's the question. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. 888-827-5536. Toll free from... Anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Neil is on the line from Santa Monica. Hi, Neil. Hey, how are you doing, Leo? I'm, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm great. How are you, Neil? Well, uh, you know, you got another dinosaur on the line. <laughs> you know, this, must be a, this must be a Jurassic Park uh, show, I guess. I think, um, honestly, um, <laughs> I probably attract dinosaurs. So, yeah. I, I just, I'll live with that, I guess. What can I do yeah. for you? I, I talked to you one time before, and I reminded you that every time I think I'm smart or clever, I just think about you and think, well, I'm an idiot. Oh, man. not so. Not so. Oh, oh, no, I don't no. know about that. But I bet there's something you're a genius at. Well, <laughs> maybe in my own mind. What's your super? What's your superpower? Well, I'm the author of the, the book, The Conscious Planet, and the reason I'm calling is about my uh, website that I'm... Uh, I'm pretty impressed with. right now. I'm pretty impressed. What is The uh, Conscious Planet about? Oh, it's a hardcore vegan uh, environmental... I want to go that way. I want to... I don't... I, 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 I think that that's the right way to be, but it's hard for me to give up meat. Well, it's very, you know what? It's easier now than ever in history. That's true. That's true. It really is. That's true. I'm going to get your book. Where can I find it? Excellent. Well, it's available through Trine Day Publishing. Okay. And it, 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 it's going to be out in like one week or two weeks. It's oh, be available. How exciting. What's the website? What's the website? My website is theconsciousplanet.org, and that's what I'm creating. The, I'm revising it right now. That it's, it re, see, I have a second edition. I have the first edition in 2012. So my website reflects my old edition right now, theconsciousplanet.org. See, I, you know, I might be good at this stuff, but you're good at that stuff. We all have our superpower. I'm very impressed. And I'm a nationally published artist. See, see, yeah. Uh, yeah, you got you got your genius going on there. Eh? You should see my stick know. figures; they're not so good. <laughs> so, well, I, I don't know. let me let me tell you what. From my domain, my sphere, what can I do to help you? Okay, well, you see, now I'm going to prove what an idiot I am. <laughs> uh oh. All right. So now, okay. So this really puts me in my place. You see. So anyway, so well, this is by the way, there's all for every human alive, even Albert Einstein, there was something where he would feel like a six year old. I guarantee you. <laughs> well, maybe when it was come to getting a haircut. There but, you go. Other, you see. But other than that, um, okay. So here, here it is. Okay, 
uh, we've been, I've been emailing for 25 years. I'm sure you've been emailing for like 30 something years. Yeah. I remember my first email account. Yeah. I was on MCI mail and you could only email other MCI mail users. So it would have been about 30 years ago. I think you're right. Yeah. 92. Yeah. Somewhere like that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I've been emailing since 98. Or there you go. Yeah, there whatever. you go. But anyway, so, okay, so here we are. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm doing my email. So what I've done is created, I, my, my website has six pages, right? Yeah. So I'm emailing one page at a time. You know, I say web page one, web page two. I, I title it on the subject matter. So I send, I'm, you know, I'm going to send it. I haven't done it, send it yet, but I'm going to send it to the webmaster, one each page, one page at a time. Okay. Okay. So I'm creating the pages. What so are you I'm using doing, to create the pages? Um, so, just, so, sounds like some piece of software that you're using. Um, well, no, no. The, the webmaster creates. The, so you're just sending him text and images and letting him make it a website. I'm just sending him emails. Got it. And that's the whole point. I'm just got sending it. him emails. That's nice. You got somebody who understands how to code it up. You're just putting the, giving him the content. That makes sense. Right. Exactly. So I'm just emailing him one. It says, it says web page one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm emailing him. So I I, I create the, the one, the first page, let's say, and I... And I send it to myself because I'm going to edit it. Maybe, or, you know, I'm going to look at it. And so I send it to myself. So I notice that the photographs, um, it, like they, they disappear. Like, and what, ah, I'm is, uh, so you're emailing them and it may be that your email program using outlook. Um, you know, it I, may not want you to send attachments as you've probably heard me say a few times. Attachments can be dangerous. What I would recommend, instead of trying to email all of this, is create a free account with, let's say, Dropbox, or if you're using Microsoft, you've got some space on OneDrive. Put the images and text there and send your webmaster the link. Say, make it public or make it, you know, make it shared and then send your webmaster the link. That way he'll get the full quality images. You don't want the email program to damage the quality anyway of the images. Right. So, so right. you want to upload them to a shared folder, in other words, on the cloud. Um, Dropbox, if you're on Apple, iCloud. Uh, uh, if you're on Windows, uh, OneDrive. Google, if your Google user has Google Drive. All of these, and almost all of them offer... Uh, at least five gigabytes for free. So you can, you don't even have to pay for an account, but your webmaster, you could even ask him, I would like to send you this via a cloud account. Do you have one you like to use? Almost certainly he will mention Dropbox. That's probably the number one cloud system. Has, has the, has the technology changed? Because I used to do this all the time. Yeah. The tech, the reason is email uh, attachments are a very common vector for viruses. So that's what's changed is security has gone up on email. Email is always a bad way to do this. Much better, create a folder in the cloud, upload all the assets, and then send a link. And that's the best way to do it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Why are you jumping up and down? Yes, Rod is here today. He's on the phone. Why are you jumping up and down? Are you cold in there? What? The game just started. Oh, the game just started. Oh, Boy, they sure took their time. We had to watch the, the Packers know. lose. And so they. <laughs> but did you see the end of that game? Yeah. I don't mind Green Bay losing, even no, though. I don't mind them losing, but the, it was an entertaining it, game. Oh, there yeah. They're end. More and more. You know, that's Mahomes, I think. Because Mahomes <laughs> likes to shovel the ball. Oh, nice. More and more, we're seeing people do these laterals and yeah. shoveling. And, they threw it backwards about 10 yeah, times. You, yeah, I thought you couldn't do it. I thought you always had to throw it forwards, but I guess No, you, you can throw it backwards. You just can't throw it forwards more than once. Ah, so it's not yeah, a forward no, pass if I you lateral it. it. Ah, that makes sense. Got it. Got it. You can't pass it forward. You have to pass it sideways. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that was quite an entertaining end to, uh, to a very disappointing game for Green Bay, I think. Michael is a huge Green Bay fan, and uh, oh, Jimmy's. See, I'm Lisa hates Jimmy. I he's so hot. He's so cute. Maybe that's why she hates him because she's not why? married to him. He's so no, attractive. she thinks he's a terrible quarterback. He's not 
terrible. He's just not the best. <laughs> I, I think with McCaffrey, we might have a chance of winning this game. We'll see. I hope so. We shall see. You better not let him get hurt. I hear he gets hurt a lot. Well, he won't be the only one on the team. <laughs> Everybody got hurt. Last <laughs> I know. Week. That's why they had to trade for him. I've never even seen the blue tent on the sidelines. I know. They, they just take him out. Everybody into. <laughs> put him. Put him on the. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, put him on the stretcher and get rid of him. All right. Let's see if we can run. Oh. Oh. Yes. He can. He can run. He can run, and he gets a first down. He's faster in there. We yeah. In there. Okay. We like McCaffrey now. Now, how do you like me? He's like three seconds ahead of us. <laughs> oh, you're just seeing it now? Yeah. You're, we're both on YouTube TV, right? No, 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 no. This is through... Uh, Some VPN to Singapore or something? No, it's just through uh, Fox.com. Ah, uh, no, I'm Fox watching on YouTube TV. Oh, that's why. So they're, in, they're, they're on the line. He hike. He hands it off. McCaffrey run. Oh, this is another... <laughs> wow. Almost, almost another first down. He got nine yards. Oh. McCaffrey. <laughs> now, now you just saw that. Yeah, I just saw that. Okay, so it's about five, ten so seconds. That's the yeah. new guy. That's the new guy. Oh, okay. The former he's Panther. Got big muscles. He's got big muscles. Not as big as Bosa's, but he's got big muscles. You don't running backs really. You just need to be like a tanks. Tank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. He just had some excellent runs. Now let's see what happens. Let's see if Jimmy can throw a interception. He's very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Look at that. Oh, oh, oh. Very nice. Leo, you're spoiling it for us. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> All right. I won't spoil it anymore for you or oh, the you audience. Have to go on the air with Rod. I got to talk to Rodney. Hello, Rodney. Oh, wait a minute. I got to pick him up, don't I? Yes, you do. Hello, Rodney. Ah, uh, now I, I had to push all the buttons. Hi, Rod. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I am well. How are you? I'm calling in from beautiful Joshua Tree, California. Oh, I'm so jealous. I've never been there. I've always wanted to go. Oh, really? Joshua yeah. Tree. You know, it's it's desert, so it's pretty scrubby. But the thing that makes Joshua Tree so amazing, I, we came, my son did this as my birthday treat, brought me out to see the the Orion It's meteor shower. Oh, an official. Oh, guy, that's really nice. The, uh, what a gift! But the hills here are are all bouldered, so it's it's this very interesting rock formation. This worth worth checking out. We're staying in this place called the Bonita Domes. It's an Airbnb, and some guy built this house out of all these beehive domes connected with tunnels, and around it he has this little kind of mini theme park of hot tubs and little separate outbuildings you can sleep in, and a fire pit and a bar. I mean, for two or three guys, it's kind of wasted. But I can see if you brought, you know, ten or twenty employees of the Leo Network out here. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's it's wild. I'll send you a picture. It's really kind of you walk in there and you sort of tilt your head like, what? It's That's like, cool. You know, I think I saw that in an Airbnb ad. I think. Yeah, maybe. Here we go. Here we are. It's time for our Rocket Man, who has landed in Joshua Tree. Where, uh, where was that a uh, was that a botched recovery or did you just decide you wanted to be there, Rod it Pyle? Was a spur, spur of the moment thing to come out and see the Orionids meteor shower. Oh, nice! On Friday morning, you were talking yeah. about that last week. Did you see some nice shooting stars? We did. You know, it's 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 famous for having very fast, very bright uh, meteors, and we saw probably depending on the evening, probably about five to six an hour, which is about average, a little less than average, but about average. And it was clear as a bell. And, of course, because we're out in the desert, it's pitch dark. You can actually see the Milky Way, which is something I'd forgotten existed practically. And um, it's fun. You know, so if you ever get a chance, there's three or four big showers per year. The main ones are this one, uh, the, the, the uh, Geminids in December and the Perseids in August. And if you can find somewhere dark, which is increasingly hard to do, but there's a website called darksky.org where you can punch in your zip code and try and find a, a spot that's dark, not too far from you. Um, it's fantastic. It's just uh, it's really something you should try once. And what a great place I would imagine to see it. Uh, there's not a lot of natu uh, artificial light in Joshua Tree, right? 
Well, there's not, although there is a little town a couple miles away, and then yeah. there's 29 Palms and further Palm Springs. So there's really no getting away from it unless you mm-hmm. literally go to the yeah. northern extreme of Death Valley or right. somewhere in Wyoming right. or Canada or out to sea, which I think I'll try next time is just, you know, go way offshore. But it's dark enough that you can see most of them. And nice. that's, that's the trick. We should yeah. mention Rod has a boat, so <laughs> he's not, yeah. he can do that. We're not going to swim out. <laughs> Rod's the editor-in-chief of the National Space Society's official magazine at Astra, author of many books, talks about space every week. Uh, on this show, what's going on in uh, in the world of space besides? Well, let's talk about your favorite topic, the Elon Artemis, Musk. huh? Oh, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. What's he up to when he's not buying Twitter? Well, now I've missed most of your uh, podcast this week, so I apologize if you discussed this at length. But this whole thing with Starlink in Ukraine. Yeah. So uh, he initially said, "I'm going to send Ukraine a bunch of Starlink terminals, which will give them internet access via my satellites." Uh, thank you very much. I am a wonderful human being. And then it turns out it's not a it. it's not a cheap thing. Uh, he's estimating yeah. it'll cost him four hundred million dollars. And went to the Pentagon, and says, "Hey guys, can you help a fella out?" The Pentagon it didn't say anything, but Elon got a lot of hate online, so he has decided, "All right, all right, I'll I'll absorb the cost." Is that a fair thumbnail of the action so far? Yeah, I mean, just some details, you know. So on February 26th, reportedly, Ukraine asked SpaceX for some help. Okay. A couple of days later, Musk said he would. And he's yeah. done this a few times. He did it with the, the cave-in in Thailand where the kids are trapped and so forth with mixed results. But, you know, there is a soul in there somewhere. There's a conscience, I guess. So he's trying, you know. Yeah. I don't think it's all – personally, I don't think it's all just about the appearances. I think no. there is some he, – he, he let uh, – I think in yeah. Haiti, he, the, uh, Starlink was set up. Uh, and the fires up in the Pacific Northwest, he right. set Starlink. So this was, of course, in the early days of Starlink. Um, right. Now, is it why is it so expensive? Well, that's what's interesting. If you do the math for just revenue, it should be like three million a month. But he he does talk about, you know, there's more cost. You know, I, I guess maybe it's a loss leader right now for them because they're still building out the system. Who knows how they do their math? He's claiming. It's more like uh, what did you say, twenty million a month? Yeah. So you know that that's by many factors more, but but maybe there's a case there to be made. You know, what's interesting like, is Iranian dissidents. You know, there's a little revolt going on in Iran. Are sneaking Starlink into Iran, not with the help of Elon, but just sneaking it in, hoping yeah. to get some internet access in a country where internet has been cut off. Well, so here's my take on this. You know, there's a lot of people giving him blowback about, you know, how dare you go to the government and demand money? Well, it was requested. You know, they said, look, we, we didn't intend to this indefinitely. Who knew eight months ago that this thing was going to go on for the better part of a year, right? I don't think people thought it would last that long. Um, and uh, he claims he's spending a lot of money to guard the system against Russian hacking, which I can imagine is true. Yeah. Yeah, because they probably have their best people. Well, up. one of the biggest issues I remember when uh, he first proposed this was those terminals are like a beacon to Russian right. air attack. Uh, you know, it's just saying, "Here we are. We're right here, over here." So um, maybe it's not the best way to s stealthily get internet <laughs> access. Yeah, uh, and I wonder if if their frequency, if their uplink frequency is software driven, or if that's baked into the server. Yeah, I don't know. Something they can switch. Like, I would bet know, with Elon, everything you know, software driven. You they know. switch radar uh, signals. Yeah, so so maybe that's a thing. But it is reported that other companies and nonprofits are starting to pitch in and covering maybe as much of a third of this. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I personally, you know, the guy drives me nuts, and it's like, okay, this is great. Stop messing with Twitter. Build your rockets. You know, let, let's move on. Well, but whatever. The news is I that do, he I do uh, and Twitter will be making a deal in the next five days. Otherwise, it's back to court. So there's a lot of incentive for them to make a deal. Uh, in the next five days, you should hear an announcement. Uh, I don't know if they'll need regulatory approval. I assume they will. But yeah. uh, Elon may take over pretty quickly from here. And then, it sh then the fireworks should be very interesting. <laughs> well, and speaking of the, the fireworks then... 
Uh, last Friday, they stacked the upper level of Starship on top of the Super Heavy booster again. This using the giant in, chopsticks? In October. Using Mexilla, yeah. And that's good because you want to make you test that thing and make sure it's good for catching, stacking, and unstacking. So I haven't really fully tested the catch mechanism yet, but they are you know, making sure the thing works. These are arms terms. that, in theory, could capture uh, this, the capsule as it's landing and then right. can restack it for the next launch, which is wild, wild it's, it's science crazy. fiction. Brilliant. Ho hose it down, fill it up, and off you go again in theory. But um, So we're thinking, you know, and, and everything is guesswork, right? Because, you know, they make their announcements on Elon time, and then we try and do our math and factor in maybe three times as long. And then there's, there's literally dozens and dozens of people permanently living around Starbase with their noses pressed to the fence every day, flying drones and watching and reporting from there. So we're thinking, you know, not they're, they've come to an accord with the FAA and so forth about launching these things finally, that maybe in the first two months of next year, they'll get that orbital test to Starship, which is a big step for them. Pretty exciting. We still don't know if it'll work, right? Yeah. One of the reasons yeah. that uh, that we have Rod on and one of the reasons we do uh, the This Week in Space podcast with Rod and Tarek Malik from Space.com is because things are starting to heat up in space and getting uh, very interesting uh, very quickly, very exciting. So It uh, is, and it's getting yeah. to the point where we can barely get through our headlines in time to bring our guest on on the podcast because there's so much to talk about. And Tarek is great because he's, you know, I do a quarterly magazine and and your show, which is wonderful. He's got to do space news hour to hour on yeah. space.com. So he's, yeah. you know, really in the groove. So when I when I need the very latest of news, I turn to him and he says, no, Rod, that's not true. It's X, Y, and Z. And I go, they have actually an excellent video at space.com space on the chopsticks picking up the... Uh, the booster yeah. and placing on top. It's kind of amazing to see. Um, yeah, well, I'll give him a little plug, but mostly give you a plug for This Week in Space, twit.tv. That's my podcast network, twit.tv, and the show is TWIS. So the full-length URL, twit.tv slash TWIS for This Week in Space. If you need even more space talk than we have <laughs> that we have on this show. Rod and Joe, how long are you going to stay uh, out at Joshua Tree? Uh, we're staying through tomorrow night. Very and, uh, nice. Where are the are the LA. are the shooting yeah. stars done? Are they over with? They go on. They they diminish after the peak, but they'll go on for the next week or so. So we'll enjoy. Take a Make look. a wish for me. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rod Pyle, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Awesome. Well, I wanted to put in a plug for you for taking a gamble on us, so thank you. <laughs> we didn't We didn't take a gamble. It's no gamble, my friend. This is all winnings. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, I've got tiger blood. Thank you. Have a great one. See ya. Most of all, I want to thank Micah Sargent for filling in for me yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Sargent. Micah will be back next Saturday, as will I, with the Tech Guy Show. Thanks, as always, to... Uh, Professor Laura, our musical director, for her great work spinning the hits from all the way back to 1938. <laughs> Thanks uh, to Kim Schaffer, our phone angel, for answering the calls. Of course, your calls are what make this show happen. We couldn't do it without you and, uh, and, and all of you who listen. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am your personal tech guy. Your, your guy on the radio, Leo Laporte. Back to the calls. we got time, I think, for a couple more. George is on the line from Rochester, New York, former home of Kodak. Hello, George. How are you today, Leo? I am well. How are you? Uh, very good, thank you. Uh, funny you should mention Kodak, perhaps. There was some parallel to my question. Uh, it seems like, and I know we're going to have a photo uh, a discussion later in the show. Maybe it could be touched there. But it seems like every time I go to a pharmacy to get my 4 by 6 prints, the quality is much better than what I would be able to achieve. Ah, in yeah. Center. And so now are we able to get printers that utilize this film as opposed to inkjet? Media. You can actually get uh, the same quality you get at the drugstore, maybe even better. Uh, but you need a special kind of printer. So an inkjet is a start, but they make inkjet photo printers, which do a better job. And if you then buy better paper, 
you'll even get a better result. And I would say with the right photo printer uh, and the right paper, you can get uh, at least as good a print uh, as at the drugstore. The drugstore is using another technology, I think, called dye sublimation. And you can get dye sub printers as well. Uh, they're more expensive per print, and uh, and the and the and the uh, what they call the consumables, the ink, cost more. But you can you can get a dye sub printer. I don't think you need a dye sub printer. I think just a good Canon photo printer or an Epson photo printer, and the right paper. Uh, that's the biggest issue I think with photo printing is if you're using the same kind of paper that you use to print documents on the kind of like the copier paper you're never going to get a good result out of that I, I didn't go to that extreme but i guess i didn't take paper into consideration yeah it's a big part of it they sell matte they sell glossy uh the the drugstore is probably using a glossy photo paper they might be they might be using uh, a traditional inkjet printer but i think more likely they're using a die sub printer you can get dice up printers for six and seven hundred bucks they're not super expensive but that's why they charge you 20 cents a print yeah i've seen them load up the uh the material so i yeah. think you're yeah. correct in yeah. what they're utilizing yeah the so, ink is even more uh, you know so it does add up i honestly think uh a canon pixma which is a which is their photo printer um and and canon sells the paper but you can get it from other uh, companies, in fact, the same companies that used to make photo printer paper uh, for people who did their own developing, like Ilford, also make paper for photo uh, uh, printers. So, m good paper makes a big difference. Uh, I would get you can get samples, you know, get five and ten sheet samples of the of the glossy and the matte, and see what you like. I bet you at your local uh, drugstore you can choose glossy or matte. Um, so some people prefer one or the other. Uh, Epson. Am I correct in assuming that if I go to eight by ten, eleven by fourteen, I'm still going to achieve a pretty good? Yes. Quality. Yeah. I used to have an Epson photo printer that did fourteen by nineteen, and uh, you'd buy big, big sheets of fourteen by nineteen paper. It was expensive, but boy, it would look good. Just make sure when you buy the printer that it says it's a photo printer. Because that specifically okay. means it'll use that those kinds of inks. Um, Epson's Expression series is the photo series, and those are very, very good. In fact, uh, you know, I've I, I've done photo safaris. We went to uh, Australia some years ago um, with some of the best photographers in the world, including a National Geographic photographer, and we used Epson uh, big format fourteen by nineteen Epson printers to print the prints that we sold in a gallery show afterwards on on uh, gallery quality paper with gallery quality uh, inks and it would the image quality was better than you'd get at a drugstore because you control it right so you can, can make sure that the color is exactly right and so forth sometimes you know you'll go to the drugstore you'll get prints back they're a little blue uh, or a little weird you know it's it's not cheap to do it yourself but you, if you are a photographer most photographers do their own printing and they probably right. do it with ink jets Okay. All right. So, yes, absolutely you can do it. A little expensive, a little time-consuming, and there is some skill involved. But if you're serious, you're going to get a much better, I think, much better result getting a good photo printer, Epson or Canon. Uh, I, You know, I'm, I'm a little uh, prejudiced towards Epson. For a long time, Epson is the only one that could do decent black and white. Ansel Adams quality black and white out of an inkjet printer. Amazing. Amazing. You're not looking for speed, right? Uh, you're probably not looking for a low cost, although the printers themselves are, for the most part, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars. They're not super expensive. Uh, and if you get the uh, inkjet that has the Epson EcoTank, they'll be a little more expensive, but the ink will be cheaper. You're going to get a great result. Go to the. You need to. What you need to do is go to. Uh, where could you go? There used to be you could go to a camera store. I don't know anymore. But it'd be nice if you could go somewhere. I doubt it'd be Staples, where you could see some samples. Uh, the other thing they do, of course, these photo printers will have more than three or even five cartridges. They'll have many cartridges, which give them a much uh, higher quality uh, choice of colors. But you can do it. 
John in St. George, Utah. Going to be the last call of the day. Hi, John. Oh, hi, Leo. Uh, I'm the last in your conga line of idiot dinosaurs. <laughs> My favorite people! Are you kidding? <laughs> Don't knock it. Well, you're so, yeah, you're so, your show's so great. I've learned so much from listening Thanks. to it. And one of the things is the importance of keeping things up to date, which yes. is my concern here. Um, I have a really old Android phone. And um, uh, I have an excuse. I was taking care of my mother in the last few years of her life, and uh, I didn't have a lot of time and energy to yeah. keep things on top of things. Yeah. But um, anyway, I'm considering I have a couple of concerns one is i'm thinking i might want to change to an iphone try to decide between that and an android um I i'm a know. big iphone fan some might say an iphone sheep or sheeple as they're called but yeah, i, I think an i'm a uh, mac mini yeah if you're already using a mac you're familiar i think the iphone is the easiest to use the best ecosystem it is a walled garden you know, uh, it is not as open, but to some degree that makes it a little bit more reliable and secure. Uh, I, if I wanted to ever switch back to Android, would it be difficult? No, no, I, I go back and forth. In fact, I use both. So I have a Pixel 7. The Pixel, if you're going to get an Android phone, in my opinion, you should get one from Google. Uh, either get the Pixel 6a or the Pixel 7, which they just came out with. The 6a is a good is a good price and excellent performance best camera just fantastic and it's the android ecosystem i just think the android ecosystem is a little loosey-goosey a little bit more open that's why some of us love it but it may be as a result a little bit less secure i think if really i'll, I'll here i'll tell you one of the things that was a deciding factor for me i there's a big hacker convention in las vegas just happened every uh, every summer and i once asked the guy who invented email encryption, Phil Zimmerman, PGP, he goes every year. I said, would you go with an Android phone? He said, not in a million years. I go with an iPhone. <laughs> you don't want to go somewhere with a lot of hackers in an Android phone. <laughs> it's just a risky uh -huh. ecosystem. So for ease of use, familiarity, uh, privacy, and security, iPhone's great. The only negative is it's Apple's way or the highway. And some people just don't like that. What do you mean? Well, the Apple yeah, Apple's a lockdown ecosystem. That's one of the reasons they're safer and more private, but they're very locked down. You have to do it Apple's way. Uh, other than that, if you can live with that, I think it's the way to go. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. If you've, you know, you used an Android phone for a long time and you feel more comfortable with Android, I think there's no harm in going with Android at all. I would get a Google phone um, because I yeah. think they're they're the cleanest Android. Well, Sam see, Samsung's switch, okay, too. The problem is, is going away from 3G, right? So my provider's offering me a choice of ah. free and discount phones. Right. And a couple of them are older model iPhones. Yeah, my mom got sent an iPhone 11 because it supported the new LTE networks. The two they have are, at, at a discount, are um, the XR, I guess it's 10R. 10R, yeah. And um, SE second generation. Um, the SE so. second generation is more up to date than the 10R. Um, I know that, but then again, when I look at the valuation online, uh, the uh, XR is higher. Evaluate. Yeah, because it's a bigger screen and people it's want bigger screen screens. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, the 10R is a great phone. It's just a little old; it's a few years old. Um, that's why they're they should be offering you that for free. I would expect. Well, actually, it would be like one hundred five dollars, and the SE second generation would be one hundred fifteen. That's after a seventy five dollar discount. Wow. Um, and then you know they have. Uh, what do they offer for Android? Well. Of the free ones, I think the, the only one I would consider for free would be the Moto G Pure, but then they have a Moto uh, G Power, maybe 2021 the, model. I think the Moto uh, Gs are 25. very good. They're very clean. They're as close to a Google phone as you can get. I don't have a problem with the Motos at all. And then um, there's uh, Nokia. Don't get a Nokia. Yeah, I would get uh, the Motos. The Pure is great. Uh, of the, that's an interesting question. I think I'd probably prefer that to the iPhone. It's more up to date. Okay, and this, my my other concern, um, which might be 
a consideration here because I do have some special considerations. And, um, I'm con- so one thing I'm concerned about is uh, first backing up all my uh, data, the uh, contacts and text messages and photos in case anything goes wrong in the process. And then the process of transferring it to the new phone. Um, and so uh, like the... The Android I have on uh, is Android 4.4.2. I discovered that. Oh, oh, ow. You know we're at yeah. 13 now, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> ow. Yeah, you really do want to get rid of that phone. It won't work anymore on the networks. Uh, are you on Verizon? Who are you on? Well, it's track phone, which was bought by Verizon. Verizon, yeah. So Verizon is the end of the year. So yeah. you have till December 31st. But still, yeah, it will stop working uh, yeah, as a phone. Soon. Yeah. Uh, you definitely want to make the upgrade. I, I think I would, of the phones you described, the Moto G Pure, I would take. And then um, uh, just, um, you know, I, then I discovered it hasn't backed up. Um, so you go into the settings and go to Google years. and you make sure that the backup is uh, enabled and then you press the button backup now. It's so old. I don't. I, I'm hoping. I'm assuming they have that capability. <laughs> back up now, and then that'll back up uh, most of what you care about. You should, you know, uh, if, if your email is on a provider that uh, stores the email for you, you'll be good there. Um, you'll have to re-download the apps you want. I don't think that's a bad discipline. Get, you know, don't just download everything willy-nilly. Download apps as needed. Um, I don't. I think that that's that's. That's going to give you all the backup you need. Just use the Google backup. So I mean, I've got low memory. It's about oh, forty-five yeah. megabytes. Oh I yeah, can make more by deleting like the Google Plus app. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can delete Google Plus. They discontinued that a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't need to delete anything. Just back it up. Get the new phone. But I, what I'm wondering is, can I? Uh, I mean, TrackPhone suggested I Bluetooth um, in with my computer to back up. Stuff, no. Then I'd have to transfer one no. file at a time. I'm no. wondering if I can connect. And they were saying because of concern about malware, but I really don't think I have any malware. I had a vast on there. No, no, don't here. don't back up your phone. Just do the Google backup. That's all you need. Well, can I, as extra security, just take the cable and connect it to my yeah. computer and drag? You have it Windows off. or Mac? You said Mac, right? Yeah, I would connect it to a Mac. So there's a program you need on the Mac. It to the Mac and then maybe drag and drop it to no, the new phone. Listen to me. Will that work? <laughs> yeah, there's a program you need on the Mac called Android File Transfer. The Mac does not understand Android phones without that. So oh. you, you put Android File. Yeah, Windows does. Mac does not. You put Android File Transfer on there. Then you can see the phone just like a drive. When you first plug it in, the phone will say, "Do you want to be? Do you want me to be a camera, or do you want me to be mass mass data storage? Say mass data storage. It'll show up as a hard drive. You can drag it and drop it from the phone to the new phone. Absolutely. Okay, Probably that Android file transfer on the computer, not yep, the phone, right? Yeah, on the computer, and it's free. You could just search for it and get it from Google. Um, if you got an and there's also Android backup programs, but I think that's fine. Just use. Just use the uh, Android file transfer. Yeah. Okay, and I can do that with, uh, and then for transferring it to, like, suppose I want to then drag and drop it onto an iPhone. Will that work? No. Uh, then it no. wouldn't work with Android file. No, with the iPhone, you need a third party app to copy it onto the iPhone. But when you get the new, if you decided on the iPhone, the new iPhone would say, okay, do you have data you want to copy over? And I think it would even work with an Android device. Mostly the time, in fact, I think this will be true of the Motorola phone as well. It'll say, do you want me to copy data from your old phone? And you say yes. I appreciate your uh, desire to make a backup. That's a very good idea, independent of that. So you can use Android file transfer to do that. Okay. Um, I know TrackPhone has a transfer uh, wizard. Yeah, everybody app, does this. But yeah. then you have to put it on both phones. And uh, like, you know, my version of Android is so old, I went on, on the Google Play Store, I couldn't find the their transfer wizard. So maybe... It, yeah, I wouldn't use anything for it on. Uh, don't use TrackPhone's version of that. Just use Google's version of all that stuff. Which? Android file transfer. 
Android.com slash file transfer. The Google backup built into your phone. There's a checkbox and the button to push. Um, and then uh, I think if you go to an iPhone, there's a switch program you download that I Apple has that will automatically pull it over from the Android side. Also suggest you use Google's contacts and calendar. Do that now. Set up that now. You probably already have. That way Google right. is always keeping your contacts and calendar and your uh, and, and basic information on the cloud anyway. So you won't, that's the main thing you don't want to lose is your phone numbers. Yeah. Yeah, and I use Google Photos, back up the photos, and you don't lose those. So Google has solutions for all of this. I would just go with the Google solutions. I think that's the best way to go. In fact, if you use Google to back up your calendar, contacts, and photos, when you get your iPhone, you just log into Google, and it'll all reappear. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to do this transfer thing. Yeah. Oh, how do I log into Google on the iPhone? Do you, do you have a Google account? Yeah. Yeah, so you go to accounts on the iPhone and press the Google button. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. iPhone supports Google very well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, I have to run. Oh, great. Well, thanks uh, Thanks so much. Okay, uh, John. Yeah. I'm sorry about your mom, and I'm, I'm glad that that's all over, and now we can move on. Yes? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, take care. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.